Guys, you know what time it is. It's your boy David at the Irish Hotspur, Ireland's number one Spurs fan, bringing you an evening with Mickey Hazard. And tonight we are joined by co-host Jack Kanicki. We are joined by Mr. Philip Brady. And of course, we are joined by Mickey Hazard. And I mean, this guy needs no introduction whatsoever. You're talking about an FA Cup winner in 82, a UEFA Cup winner in 84, where both his crosses led to goals and both legs versus Andalex. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Mickey Hazard with us. First of all, Mickey, how are you keeping my man? I'm keeping very well, thank you very much. I'm uh, looking forward to the show. Nah, look, I'm definitely looking forward to taking a trip down memory lane, that's for sure. Mr Brady, how are you keeping? Oh, great. Yeah, great, David. I'm delighted to see Mickey there. I would have seen him play in the flesh in the lane in the 80s, so it's great. You can't that. possibly be that old. Oh, believe it, I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, a Tottenham legend in the, on the show now and really looking forward to it yeah no it definitely is and Jack you know how are you keeping my man I'm getting a bit of goosebumps David you know a bit starstruck you know we're joined by an absolute legend but uh, a quick disclaimer everybody you know maybe just for this show and this show especially we really really want to honor Mickey's time we want to honor his generosity uh, for giving up his time out of his day out of his evening uh, to show up for this one so everybody if you can if you possibly can please refrain possibly from uh, sending in the super chats we want to send in as many questions as we can to the guy you know and use his time uh, as best and most efficiently as we would like to we don't want to you know uh, we just want to you know he's been very generous to show his time today and give us his time today so we'll leave a bit of 15 20 minutes at the end of the show for him to answer some of your questions the harris army uh, but hopefully you guys enjoy this one uh, as always it's going to be a class act show uh, we will have mickey back in here but um, like I said, everybody, just a quick disclaimer, please, 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 if you possibly can, maybe refrain from the super chats for tonight, just that we can use Mickey's generosity and his time as best we can. But yeah. David, doing absolutely well, bit goosebumpy, bit you know starstruck at the moment. Uh, but we do have uh, an absolute legend joining us tonight. Get a bit of history lesson for myself. No, it is. It's 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 look, and I uh, hopefully everybody really enjoys this trip down memory lane, as we know. We have so many people here who talk about the glory days, you know, talk about the FA Cup run, talk about the UEFA Cup run, and are huge fans of the likes of Mickey Hazard and, um, you know, Graham Roberts, Steve Perryman, Glenn Hoddle, Ozzy Ardiles, Ricky Villa. I know my old lad always told me an awful lot of stories about all, all you guys, Mickey. You're all absolute legends. But look, you know, Mickey, let's get into it. So, look. What are some of your um, earliest footballing memories? And tell us, how does a boy from Sunderland end up playing for Tottenham Hotspur? Um, oh, it's a good question. Um, well, first of all, um, the assistant manager of Tottenham Hotspur Football Club at the time in 1973-72 was Terry Neal. Terry Neal was the manager and Wilf Dixon was the assistant manager who um, was born and bred in Sunderland. So we set up a little scouting network uh, up the north um, with a good friend of his called Ken Pedestan, who scouted and, and attended every single game that I ever played in for my school, my town or my county. 
Um, and then when I was 14, he sent me down with my dad to Spurs. Um, cause in those days you couldn't come before 14 and, mm. um, we loved it. And, um, obviously they promised us that we would uh, get YTS. So that was another added bonus. And, uh, that's how I ended up with Spurs. So it was, uh, a blessing in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> Good blessing in disguise, I bet. Maybe so. Uh, but Mickey, another question maybe on some of your earlier days at Spurs. Can you maybe take us through some of those youth academy days, you know, at, at Spurs? Maybe, in fact, share with us some of your favorite memories or maybe not your favorite memories because, of course, you had to move down to London and whatnot. I mean, what was it like maybe, you know, kind of growing up through the Spurs Academy? Well, no, two things. One, uh, it's 16 years of age to leave your your yeah. mum, your dad, your brothers, your sisters. I come from a big family and um, had never been away from them. So to come down to a big place like London um, was very, very tough. Um, in fact, probably the toughest thing that I've ever had to do. Wow. Um, my football memories um, were somewhat clouded by the fact that I was homesick um, for, mm. for six, seven months. Um, but once I settled... Um, I quickly realised how, how lucky I was to be playing for a club like Spurs. Um, that t probably took me about a year to get settled. Um, some of my earliest memories was learning all about the North London derby, um, playing in a North London derby, playing in a, a juniors or a youth team game against your biggest rivals <laughs> and what it meant even at that level to actually beat them. I remember I scored probably the best goal I ever scored in my life against the Arsenal youth team <laughs> uh, in a friend in a in a league game at um, Chesant um, I played four one twos from the off wheel line wow um, with the final one two uh, we were a yard apart pinged it in and got the return and then took it round the keeper and slotted it into an empty net so oh, um, and it was described in the match day program a, a week later as a copybook goal um, so great memories and, and, and obviously it it fed the required information into me of how important later on in life when, when you break through into the first team, how big this North London derby game is and what it means to the fans and what it means to you as right. a player if right. you can win the game and play a big part in winning the game. A quick follow-up then, like, what was it like? How did you overcome that homesickness? Simply put, I mean, not a lot of us can sometimes. Um, I think time, number one, but I also think Tottenham showed incredible patience with me. Um, yeah. I ran off warm six times. Um, <laughs> and in the end, they said, look, we're going to bring you back. If you run away again, we'll retain your registration. But to help you settle, we will send you home to Sunderland for five days every 10th day so you stay down for 10 days and then you go home for five days and then you mm. come back and you have another 10 days so for for about 18 months i went home every 10th day following the youth team game on the saturday i'd go home until the wednesday come back on the wednesday and prepare for the following saturday's youth team game and that went on for 18 months over two years so tottenham were incredibly patient they were incredibly mm. kind uh, they were very strong with me, but they were also very kind. Um, and that, in the end, is what enabled me to settle down. And and maybe just another quick follow-up on, on how you ended ended up at Tottenham as well, Mickey, is I believe at, at that time you couldn't really sign for a club uh, more than an hour away. So how did you, how did you end up um, getting down to Tottenham? Well, at the end, as I said, Tottenham scouted me from about the age of 11. Um, never missed the game that I played in. Um, but obviously at that point I couldn't travel down to Tottenham mm. and certainly not without my parent anyway um, but at the age of 14 uh, the rules were different from the age of 14 at four, once you hit 14 you could travel outside of an hour um, whereas before the age of 14 you could only go to a club within an hour of your home obviously they didn't want you travelling throughout the night and missing your schoolwork so the, the rules got changed when you were 14 which meant that as soon as I was 14 I could travel down to Spurs in school holidays spend a week there spend two weeks there train with the boys 
and then travel back home when we went back to school. So um, that that was it. The rules were just different then, but at 14, they changed. Wow. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Philip? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been the Sunderland thing. I mean, it's, were you a Sunderland fan when you were a kid? Uh, it very, I suppose, in many ways, so I'm just putting the charger in. Um, in many ways, I suppose I could have been. Um, the, the problem with it was is that um, Spurs signed me from the age of 11. Mm -hmm. um, so, from if if you look at when you really start taking a really interest in football, when you get to sort of eight, nine, ten, yeah. um, it wasn't long before Spurs uh, mainly won my heart. Um, wow. Once you've signed for a club, they become your club. Um, yeah. So Sunderland um, were my second team then because I, I knew I was going to sign for Spurs. Um, so Sunderland quickly became my second team. Um, and although I played for Sunderland boys, not the actual Sunderland AFC boys, but Sunderland town, you know, they have yeah. um, probably all over the country. They have um, Middlesbrough boys, Newcastle boys, London boys or whatever. I played for Sunderland boys, um, but it never... Um, and we used to play at Roker Park, which was Sunderland's own ground, and they tried to sign me on numerous occasions and made a last-ditch effort to sign me when uh, but you know the, the big problem for Sunderland was that how could I be expected to sign for Sunderland when they were in Division 2 and mm. Spurs were a top club in Division 1 at the time mm. so there was no decision to make really my dad ultimately made the decision but uh, there wasn't really a decision to be made well, mm. what would have happened if Newcastle had come in for you <laughs> <laughs> uh, who never heard of them? Yeah, yeah, sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other problem. They, they wouldn't have had a chance. Number one, I was from Sunderland, uh, and oh. number two, my mind was made up, and my dad's mind was made up that um, we were going to Spurs. Good, great answer. Great, great answer, Philip. I know you have another question for Mickey yeah. as well. Yeah, the, the the reserve team model that would have been in force in your day at Spurs is now gone, and it's the under twenty three model. Which would you think is a better system, the old one or the new one? The old, I think that um, I'm not being biased in any way, shape or form. But if you look at the reserve team system, anybody within the football club can play in the reserves. So in other words, when I was up and coming youngster, coming through at the age of 16 and managing to get a place in the reserves, I could be playing with Glenn Odell. I could be playing with Ozzy Ardiles because they might be coming back from injury. Mm -hmm. um, so the beauty of not only playing with them, but I could have been playing against Liam Brady, who was coming back from injury and, and needed a couple of games to get match fit. So the beauty of the reserve team football is you play, you play with great players, first team players, so you gain lots of experience and know how, but also you play against first team players. So you learn so much quicker. The problem with an under-23 team is that it's exactly what it is. You play against under 23s. Mm. Uh, and and while I like the idea that it gives you longer to succeed and make it to the top, I don't actually like the idea that you're stuck in playing under 23s football <laughs> until you're under 23. Yeah. Uh, until you're 23, because <laughs> um, you're not learning off great, great footballers. You, you might have very, very good youngsters, but they've not played at the very top of the game. Mm. So there's, there's there's nothing to learn from. Uh, you're just learning off your your yes. relative age groups. Whereas it was when you play, combination, in, wasn't it? There was no yeah, it was combination. combination. When you're playing in the first thing, uh, you know I played with. I, I remember playing in one reserve game. We had Odell, Velia, Ardiles, Perryman, all playing in the in oh, the reserve wow. team. Jesus. And here I was as a 17 year old playing with them. Good so, God. The experience that you gain from that is phenomenal. Uh, but also, I mean, I've played against Jerry Francis, who was England captain. He was wow. coming back from injury and he was playing in the reserves and I happened to be playing the day that he was playing. You know, so it cannot Bring it back. Be. Learning the game is the greatest thing you'll ever do. And you learn the game by playing with and against great players. And that's what reserve team football does for you. It enables you to do that 
maybe even before you're ready to do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. excellent. Yeah. Absolute great insight there, I have to say. And it's 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 one that I've been thinking of for, for a while because especially my age, I mean, I came I was born and I grew up with the reserve team system and then it changed to the under 23. So it was, it was absolutely brilliant to get that insight, Mickey. Um, but of course, we're, uh, we will talk about um, uh, Glenn, Glenn Goddle, as we call him over here, and Ozzy Ardiles a bit later on. But um, Mickey, you did make your Spurs debut um, against Everton in the first division in April of 1980. What is it like making your debut for Tottenham Hotspur? What emotions or feelings went through you? Well, I think that... Um... I think it goes without saying that it, it's probably probably the most exciting thing that you ever hear. Wow. It's it's a coming together and a fulfillment of all your schoolboy dreams. Mm -hmm. Not just for your yourself and your own dreams, but for your parents' dreams for you. Um so you don't just fulfill your own dream, you fulfill your parents' dream too. Um, and my everlasting memory of being told that I was going to be starting in the Everton game was running down Tottenham High Road and ringing my mum. And then having to hold the phone about 15 yards away from my ear as my mum was screaming so loud. You know, the whole of London could hear and she was 300 miles away. Um, yeah. But the excitement for my parents was was matched by the excitement that I felt. Um, and, it, the, the, you know, that to be making your debut for a, a big football club like Tottenham is, is amazing. But also, I'm not sure it's on a par with um, telling your parents that you're making your debut. I don't think there's a better feeling in the old wide world than giving your mum and dad such incredible news. So uh, it, it, it's filled with um, so many emotions because of, um, one, you've got your own emotions, um, and you don't really know what to expect, although you've you've been training at the club and training with these players and playing with these players, you've not actually played in a first team game. So uh, there's a there's an excitement, but a apprehension as well. Am I good enough? You know, can I can I go in there and play with Glenn Odell and Ozzy Ardiles and and control the game with them? Am, am am I strong enough mentally to do that yet at the age of 19, 20? Um, and they were a fully established. World Cup winners and, and great footballers. So, uh, yeah, incredible, incredible feeling. Um, was I nervous? No, I wasn't nervous, not one bit. Did I enjoy it? Wow. Um, can't really remember it other than the fact that I got voted man of the match. Wow. Um, I've got to say it was a... Um, I got the sympathy vote because I was a young lad making his debut and I had this big, massive... Um, blonde curly hair so it was easy to, to pick out um, you know you, you don't get man of the match on your debut if you're playing alongside Glenn Odell and Ozzy Ardiles um, <laughs> the two such wonderful footballers so um, quite happy to accept the reward yeah but was I really no I played well but I don't think I was the best player on the pitch no wow I think that's a bit too humble that's very humble of you and you still you did your parents get down to the match? Um, no, they didn't know. 300 miles away. You only find out on the Friday afternoon. Um, we weren't particularly the wealthiest family in the world, so to to find however much it would cost to travel down from the northeast, book into a hotel, etc., cetera, mm. um, was sort of beyond us. I was on about 20 quid a week at the time, um, so I obviously couldn't afford it neither. Or mm -hmm. I might have been on 80 quid a week. I can't remember. In fact, it was probably 80. Um, so, uh, no, I didn't have any members of my family at my debut. I had them later down the line, um, coming down to games, but not at my debut. Because, as I said, we found out at sort of three o'clock on the Friday afternoon. Um, so it was very late in the day when, generally, when it gets confirmed that you're going to be playing. Yeah. And uh, do you know, what? I love the way you talk about it with such um, such a smile on your face again, the way it's bringing back the memories. It's brilliant. And that that you're a family man, like make, making your debut for Tottenham Hotspur is is, is is it's no mean feat. You know what I mean? And the fact that you're you're still linking it back to being able to tell your parents in a proud moment. It's absolutely, it's absolutely amazing. But what I do want to ask you is, and if my research is, um, is correct, Mickey, were you not supposed to make your debut the week before? 
Yes, I was actually, and, and, and my family would have been to that one because we were playing in Manchester United, um, and we, uh, I was informed that I would be playing um, at Old Trafford, and um, I, we trained in the gym every Friday, and um, I got um, a massive blister on my big toe, mm. and. Um, Without consulting the physio, I decided to pop it myself, <laughs> and it turned poison. <laughs> so by the Saturday morning, I couldn't walk. It was so it was full of poison, you know. So um, the I obviously couldn't play, and the team lost four nil. I often think to myself, what would have happened if the team had won four nil? Would I have made my debut the following week? Probably not. Um, and who knows? how the future would have fallen from there. Uh, but the team lost 4-0. Not that I wish them to lose 4-0, but it, it's an interesting fact that um, if they won 4-0, I probably wouldn't have made my debut the following week and maybe would have had to uh -huh. play well in the reserves for a little while longer. But uh, they lost 4-0. And, uh, and from there, I sort of um, played a few games and, and that season and then a few games the following season before I eventually broke through and played... 45, 46 games in, in the next season. Wow. wow. Jeez. That's, 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 I mean, I guess if you want to look at it that way, that's impressive, you know, very, very humble again, very humble again. But if it's all right, Mickey, I kind of want to take you back through that 1982 cup campaign. What was maybe the difference for you between maybe the FA cup final and that league cup final in 1982? I mean, did you prepare differently? Was the squad morale any different uh, compared to the league cup final? I mean, what was the difference between those and maybe even share any memories that you had during that campaign? Uh, the big difference was that we lost the League Cup final and won the FA Cup final. <laughs> but no, the, the, the thing was that we should have actually won both. We were an absolutely mm. amazing team. And in fact, Ozzy Ardiles says that the best team he's ever played in was the 1982 Spurs team. And we got wow. to the final of the League Cup and we won the up with two minutes to go and Steve Archibald went round Grobola and missed and then we gave a stupid goal away in the last seconds of the game. Uh, and then we lost after extra time. Um, yeah. But we deserved to win that game. We should have won that game. Um, and I really believe if we won that game, we could have won all four trophies because we were competing for all four. Mm. Um, the FA Cup final, did we prepare different for either? No, we always prepared the same. Uh, whenever it was a big game, we would go to an hotel in, Orf in, 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 the, in Orfordshire and we'd spend the night in the hotel before the game. Uh, we would go, get up at so 8 o'clock the following morning and, and we'd go for a two or three mile walk as a group, group of players, two or three mile walk together um, with the management team. Then we'd go back and have our pre-match meal and then we'd get a coach to the game. So mm. we prepared in exactly the, some, some days, if it was an evening game, um, we would, we, we would um, train in the morning rather than go for a walk. Uh, but on the cup finals, because it was an afternoon game, just went for the, the morning walk. Um, we prepared in exactly the same way for both games. Um, we were just unlucky that um, Archibald missed and they got a, a last gasp equaliser. Uh, and then we, we sort of ran out of steam in extra time, really. Um, so, yeah, no change. Uh, the end result uh, was different, but should have been the same. We should have won both cups. I mean, that's actually, it sounds like the most glorious walk I would ever want to take, honestly, yeah. for that, that period of time. But it's actually fascinating. You guys actually prepared the exact same. And it seems like you're just extremely hard done by in that League Cup final. But do you have any memories maybe of that actual campaign in the FA Cup? Maybe even particular moments from yourself or from other players? Well, the campaign of the League Cup final, for instance, major great memories from that. We won three of the legs that we played, we won one nil and I scored all three goals. Um, <laughs> so I sort of played quite a big part and was, I, I scored the winner in the semi-final um, against West Brom to get us to Wembley. Wow. And I scored two other winners in one nil wins as well. So um, I played quite a big part in that. And then the, the memory of the FA Cup was I got the winning goal in the quarter final of the FA Cup against Chelsea in a 3-2 win. Um, many memories of that that game because we, the kickoff was three o'clock at Stamford Bridge, 
and at quarter to three, we weren't even in Fulham Road, um, which is where the Stamford Bridge is. We were still in traffic on a coach, Whoa. so we had to stop the coach, get get the kit, the kit uh, skip off from underneath the, uh, the 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 doors underneath the base of the coach, get bring the kit bags onto the coach and start handing out all the kit and getting prepared on the bus. So Shit. because uh, you had to <laughs> you had to have your team in by off too, so we got a ten thousand pound fine because we didn't get the team until five to three. We didn't have a team talk. He just named the team and we went straight out onto the pitch, oh my um, God. which was quite incredible, really. And uh, we went in at half time, one nil down. Um, but in the second half, we played football made in heaven. Uh, we were just absolutely incredible. And, and in, in a 25 minute spell, uh, I, I, we just ripped them apart and, and went 3 1 up. And then, sort of, not towards the end, they got a lucky fluke deflected goal to make it 3 2. Um, but it was an absolute stroll in the park, to be honest with you. We were worthy winners and could have won six. What a wow. second half. What a second half performance. Seriously, I can't even imagine that. Just, you know, coming off about 10 minutes before the match as well. Seriously, that is insane. Um, but I think uh, Philip wants to take you maybe through that 1984 yeah. UEFA Cup winning campaign. I mean, I think that the, the, the 1984 final against Anderlecht, the second leg at home, I don't think I've ever heard a crowd as loud in all my life that the, the support the team, the crowd gave the team that day. It must have been amazing sitting in the dressing room before the game, waiting to come out, hearing the noise that was coming in from the crowd. Did it inspire the team? I think that um, every time anybody walks out, not just me as a player or any of the other players, I think if anybody, uh, even fans, um, were to walk up the tunnel out onto the pitch to glory, glory, hallelujah, uh, glory, glory, Tottenham Hotspur and the fans singing. Um, it was possibly the most motivational, inspirational record that you could possibly play. So if you didn't get on that pitch um, on a massive European night, a European Cup final, then you were never ever going to get yourself up for a game because there was no better feeling. Um, you know, even coming from the hotel, we, we did pretty much the same as we did in the previous cup finals. We stayed in a hotel, we had our pre match meal in the hotel, and then we drove our cars down to the stadium, driving down Tottenham High Road a couple of hours before the game. And the amount of fans that were there two, two and a half, three hours before the game was just incredible. <laughs> um, and and of course, um, getting into the the dressing rooms, not just in the final, but in every game. You know, the greatest the greatest thing about that, and what's often a well, I'm not sure it is overlooked, but it it sort of feels overlooked is that will probably be the last time any team ever wins a European trophy on its own stadium. That's right, and. That was the magic of the competition, is that and what the, to get to the final, but to have the final game of that competition in front of 40,000 cheering, shouting Spurs fans just made it um, incredibly special. But also, remember, it was Keith Birkinshaw's last game. He'd resigned just prior to it um, over a dispute he had with Irving Scholar. Um, so... The emotion, not just the excitement and the thrill of being in a major European final in, on your own stadium in front of your own fans, but also the emotion that the manager, the only manager that I'd ever really known, was going to be leaving after the game. And also I was picked for the full England squad three days after the UEFA Cup final at Hampden Park against Scotland. It was possibly the greatest and saddest, if you can have the greatest and saddest, day in football rolled into one, then that was it. Because to win the trophy with the very last kick of the game, with the last penalty, uh, uh, but then in in amidst such incredible um, celebrations, to then take a moment to see that you've lost your manager, he's now no longer manager, uh, it, it, it made for what I say was the greatest emotions footballistically that I've ever experienced, but also yeah. the saddest 
emotions footballistically I've ever experienced all rolled into one. So it was a, a, an incredible special evening, but tinged with sadness. Wow. Talk about mixed emotions. Jeez. Yeah. Um, we, we, we'll just take a comment here. What's the story? Says Mick, Mickey Hazard, Hodden and Ardiles. What a trio of midfielders. They were the envy of Europe at the time. Legends all. Thanks for the memories, Mickey. You're a wonderful player. And that's from my old lad. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I, I, I would imagine that we were because it's rare. And particularly in English football at that time, um, which was very much hell-bent on playing this long ball up and under game. Um, to have three players of Odell Ardiles and Azad all playing in the same team, all equally as gifted as one another, uh, all very, very talented and naturally talented, um, was a rarity. Um, because obviously managers in the English game like ball winners, they like box to box players. It was rare that you saw three skillful, creative flair players play midfielders at that. Because how do you win the ball back? Well, you win it back by brains. You know, your brain um, has to think quick. Your brain has to make you move quick. You have to read situations. And, and while we might, might not have been the best tacklers uh, at winning the ball back, we were very, very good at intercepting and reading the game. So um, it wasn't uh, a necessity to have a ball winner because when we had the ball, nobody could get it. Um, mm -hmm. So when you've got the ball, you don't have to defend. Um, but no, that was a wonderful midfield, I've got to say. And um, I wish, um, I, I won't talk about myself, but I wish that today's team would have Odell and Ardiles in their team because I'm certain that would lead us to um, success again. And and look, before maybe we get on to Ozzy Ardiles, because I know he was a huge influence on your football book career. But is there is there anything else that stands out in the UEFA Cup winning campaign? Like, was there any part along the journey that maybe you felt, yeah, hang on, this is our cup here, we're going to win this? It, 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 you know what? I played in a, in, in a team that I, every game I ever played, I felt we were going to win. Um, mm -hmm. But I particularly thought that we would win in Europe because of the quality of the f and the type of footballers that we had in the team. Um, we were made to play European football, really. Uh, um, so when we won it, it was no surprise to me. And, and I, I thought that once Keith had decided he was resigning, I just thought that it was fated that we were going to win the trophy to celebrate with Keith uh, on his departure. Wow. Um, so I never had any doubts, no <laughs> doubts whatsoever in my mind that we were winning the UEFA Cup. And even when we were 1-0 down, it, uh, maybe I was just being too romantic, <laughs> um, but I just genuinely thought we're winning this trophy. It's as simple as that. I never doubted it at any moment. Um, and of course we did. Um, but when I look at it now, in hindsight, um, my my lack of doubt that we were going to, you know, that my belief that we were going to win it, maybe maybe was unfounded because we could easily have lost it. We were one nil down, and um, and that we we're getting towards the end of the game, and then penalty shootout from four three up, and needing to score, we miss, and mm. um, we could easily have lost it again. So um, when I look back, I think, how did I have such a uh, uh, an incredible belief that we were winning it. It just never felt that we weren't going to. Um, you know, I scored the winner in the semi final. Um, did I? Yeah. Play, uh, I, I just felt that we were winning this cup. It's as simple as that. And, um, you know, when you look at the amount of great players that we lost that day, we had no Hoddle in, in the final, we had no. Ardiles, we had no Perryman who got suspended for the second leg. We had no Ray Clements. We had no Garth Crooks. Five wow. players that would be sort of regular starters yeah. um, didn't start. And yet, here I was playing without those five players. Absolutely stone clear in my head that we were winning this trophy. So maybe now in hindsight, it was, it was wow, I was a bit brave there. Um, but it just felt, this is our, tro this is our cup. It's fate. Yeah. Wow. That, that that that's absolutely insane. I absolutely love that. I want the way that, that mentality. 
but through, through the whole whole competition, you know, we need more players of you with that mentality, Mickey, nowadays. Well, Philip Brady, I know you have a question there you, you want to follow up. Just, just going back to 20 seconds before you provided the cross for Graham Roberts to score the equaliser, Ozzy Ardiles missed from about three feet out. <laughs> what went through your mind when you saw that? How did you get the thoughts back together again to put that cross? I, I, I actually, actually, we quite rib him about it all these years later. In fact, yes, Graham Roberts can thanks him forevermore. Every time he sees him, he says, "Thanks, Ozzy." Ozzy says, "What for?" He said, "Well, if you just took that in the net, he said I wouldn't have been the, the match-winning hero." Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, so Ozzy made Graham Roberts an absolute and total legend because he ended up getting the goal. But yeah. but how was he missed it? I'll never know. I, I think you're being kind saying three foot. Oh, it, right, was okay. more, it, it, it was more like um, a foot <laughs> and a half. <laughs> it was no more than a foot and a half. How he, con how he somehow contrived to smash the shot against the bar is totally over my head. Um, I thought I thought it was impossible to do that, but he did it. Um <laughs> And Ozzy, obviously, in response to any digs that way, he says, look, he said, I wanted someone else to be the hero, so I deliberately missed. No. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was a miss that, wow, I'd have cried if I'd have missed it. I yeah. can't believe you guys even had those conversations. That's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, still to this day, because yeah, we play golf all the time together. Um, and often we will bring up, uh, we'll talk football, um, and we'll talk about, um, you know, because Graham's it's Graham's greatest achievement in football to be captain of uh, the team in the Europe in a European Cup final mm. was was phenomenal uh, to score the goal that eventually and then score a pen, penalty as well. I mean, the story when Keith says, you know, who who wants to go first? You know, when he's asking the penalty takers, Graham says, "I'll go first, and we'll be one nil up." You know, yeah. not yeah. there in his head, he, he just. I'm the captain. I'll lead. He was a centre back as well. I'm the captain. I'll lead the way. I'll put us one nil up, and then the rest just have to uh, score and we win. Um, and that was sort of the mental. Listen, I think what happens is when you win trophies and you get over the line, mm. it becomes easier to win the second one if you get yourself into a position for the second one and then the third one. Mm. It always gets easier because you've experienced what it takes to get over the line. So when we were in the UEFA Cup final, it never—I never felt at any stage that we weren't winning this trophy, and and maybe that was because we'd won trophies and we'd been over the line. Um, so uh, I don't think it's—I think the way to approach any game, not just the cup final, is that um, we're going to win this game um, because. It was the great Bill Nicholson that says, you know, we at Tottenham, we aim high, so high, in fact, that even in defeat, we'll bring with it an echo of glory, you know. Mm -hmm. And and the, the thing is about defeat, if you don't believe you're going to win, then you're not going to win. Mm -hmm. So the first, uh, the first path to glory is to actually convincing yourself that you're going to win this trophy uh, and play with no fear. Uh, but play with passion and desire and, 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 and play your normal game because that was good enough to get to your final. No doubt it'll be good enough for you to win the final. So, yeah, um, mentality plays a massive, massive part yeah. in getting over the line. And uh, just another quick follow-up question is um, the FA Cup, of course, you've won the FA Cup, the UEFA Cup. I mean, absolutely incredible achievements there, uh, Mickey. But what journey did you enjoy more? Because, look, we all know the FA Cup, what it meant back then compared to maybe what it means to some people now. It meant a lot more back then. So what campaign did you enjoy more? I think it's important to remember that back in them days, the FA Cup was absolutely massive. Yep. It was the only televised live game. It was wow, a major, yeah. major cup to win. But the European Cup was the whole of Europe. And it was like the Champions League then. Because only the top team went into the European Cup, but the second, third, fourth and fifth went into the UEFA Cup. So we could play, I mean, we played Real Madrid, Barcelona, Bayern Munich. We played every top team in the UEFA Cup. So it was a major trophy to win. Um, if you asked me when I was 11, what, what would I wanted to win? I always dreamt 
of winning the FA Cup, um, walking out at Wembley in front of my parents uh, and and running around the pitch celebrating the victory would have, would have always been my dream. But which did I enjoy? I enjoyed the UEFA Cup absolutely immensely. I thought that was my... Um, the greatest memories that I have of my football career is winning the UEFA Cup. It surpassed the FA Cup. Um, and I think what done that was the emotion that surrounded the final. Um, going into the final with five of your best players injured, your managers resigned. Um, you should have won the first leg 3-0, but you came warm because of a goalkeeping error, 1-1. Um, and then to win it in the way that we won it with the very last kick of the game, I, I, I don't think... If, in it from a football playing career, anything could possibly better that. Um, it was incredible. Uh, yes, I've had a, a better experience in football, but from my playing career, nothing would better the UEFA Cup. Great answer. I'm also still still like absolutely shell shocked that you were talking about miss sitters with Ozzy on the golf course. That just sounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll never let can't believe that's brought up. We'll never let him forget. Don't worry about that. <laughs> never let him forget. Any any maybe any funny pranks or any funny stories along the way on any of them um, wild European away nights? Well, there's there's, there's millions of stories. Um, <laughs> are they for public consumption? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, don't no, to... absolutely. The, 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 listen, the, the the best thing that you can say about um, the European away nights was that we used to fly out there on the Tuesday morning, train. If it was Spain, we were playing at or Czechoslovakia, would train would would go to the the stadium of the or the training facilities of the team we were playing. Uh, we would train and, and then we'd pre prepare as we would in England. Uh, we'd get to bed early, we'd eat, eat the right foods, drink the right drinks. Um, and then we'd play the game the next evening. Um, so the, the Wednesday night we would play the game, but we'd fly home Thursday morning. Mm. So you can imagine following the game, that you know, we'd won the game, say, and we were in the town on the Wednesday night. And remember, <laughs> we've got a league game on the Saturday. Um, and the coach would be waiting for um, to arrive to pick us up at the hotel off seven to get us to the airport for, for 10 o'clock flight back home to England. I have to tell you that probably 75% of the team rolled in straight from the night out at <laughs> off seven <laughs> to get on the coach. Uh, so nobody had had any sleep. We'd get on the coach to the airport um, and then would fly home straight back to the training ground and would train for an hour to get the night before out your system ready for the Saturday. If you saw those training sessions, you would laugh. People were falling over. They missed kicking the ball because they'd still um, inebriated from the night before. Uh, they were <laughs> hilarious, the training sessions. But come the Saturday, everybody was back on its metal. Everybody was shit hot. Um, yeah. So uh, we lived it up, but we never, ever didn't wear the shirt with pride. And look, I think that's why we all call you Tottenham legend, Mickey. You know, you you, you, and uh, all the other players in that great era was unbelievable. But one player I do want to talk about, and um, his name pops up a lot, but you were also on record, Mickey, as saying Ozzy Ardiles was a huge influence in your career. Is there any particular reasons for this? Or what is it maybe that Ozzy done that really helped you? Well, number one, Ozzy was an unbelievably great footballer. He was a World Cup winner. Um, but the greatest thing about Ozzy was the time that he gave to all youngsters, not just me. All youngsters, he would, he would, you know, the great thing for me with Ozzy was that we played in a similar position, yet he would often pull me aside and advise me. Um, obviously, he took to me, we became very good friends very quickly. Um, mm. He loved the way that I played the game. Um, Ozzy was a purist, he wanted to play purist footballers, so mm. he took a lot more time and gave me a lot more time and attention and advice. Um, and his football brain was second to none, and I mean to none. Um, he, he had an ability to make 
everyone that he spoke to feel very special to him. Um, you felt like you were his very, very best friend. Um, and when he spoke, if he said, what a great player you are, that just raised your level up 10 notches because this great player had actually said it. But the time, effort and, and advice that he gave me throughout my young years, um, I'll remain... He'll, he'll remain one of my very, very, very best friends forevermore. Um, I play golf with them three times a week. Me and him are always partners. He was my room partner when we played. Um, he really was a genius, um, an absolutely brilliant player, but with a brilliant mind. And he helped everybody that he came into contact with. Wow. Jeez. Well, uh, Philip, I know you. I know you. I think you might have one or two follow-up questions here. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of backtracking a little bit onto the previous answer, but and the 1982 Cup. Uh, how much of an impact was it on the squad when Ozzy had to leave because of the Falklands problem? Um, listen, I, I think when you um, lose any player um, from a starting eleven, it's difficult. When you lose one of your greatest, but not just one of your greatest footballers, but also the one who's achieved the ultimate prize in football, the World Cup, uh, and the, the mentality that that brings to the squad. You know, when people talk about Ozzy's influence, they never mention the fact that he brought a winning mentality to the club in 78. And while it took a few years for it to, to, to sort of bear fruit, um, it, ultimately it was Ozzy that had... Um, and Ricky, you brought this mentality that we could compete at the highest level. We could win trophies. Um, so it's often overlooked when people talk about Ozzy, what he brought to Tottenham because he's such a good player. But he also brought the win, the winning mentality and changed the mentality of us all. We all started to believe that we could, we could win trophies. We, we were one of the best teams in the league uh, and we were able to win trophies. But Ozzy, um, it was a lot to do with... So when you lose him from the semi-final, you know, he played in the semi-final at Villa Park and when you know he's not in the final, of course, he's a big loss. Um, but ultimately, we lost five of them in the UEFA Cup final and we still went on and won it. You know, mm. I, I'm i not a, I'm not an excuse maker. Uh, you, you have a, a squad of players and if... You have six injuries, you have six injuries. That's how it is. There's nothing you can do to change it. And, and it's an opportunity um, for players who um, come into the side to replace those six, to stake their claim for their place in the team. Um, and that's how it should be viewed. It shouldn't be viewed as, oh, dear me, we've lost six top, top players. Oh, we're going to win this game. No, it's the players that come into the side, they say, they should be saying, I've got to win my places. What an opportunity I've got, uh, particularly in a cup final. But also the ones that are in the side are thinking, come on, I've got to do a little bit more because I've lost six good players and mm -hmm. we've got we've had to bring in a few kids. You know, so we have to be, uh, help the kids along even more. So um, I felt it worked in our favour that a lot of the kids that came into the UEFA Cup final team, people like Ali Dick and, if you looked at that team, we had basically a, a very much a, 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 almost an homegrown team. Um, and that helped us because we all put, sort of came through the system together uh, and we're used to playing and winning things together because we won the combination, the Reserve League, three years running together. Um, so we knew what it took to win. And, and of course, none of us folded on the night. None of us looked for the excuses. Oh, well, if we lost, we've got a perfect excuse. Six players injured, the manager leaving. Um, who wants to make excuses? I want. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't want to spend the after match uh, routine talking about how, how we lost. You know, we lost five great players and manager resigned. I wanted to talk about what it felt like to hold the trophy aloft, uh, and thankfully we did. Uh, wow, we need that mentality. And just quickly. Do you think that maybe players nowadays get too many excuses made for them or they use too much as excuses on like compared to, to, to what you you guys were like back in the day? Well, I hope not. Um, I think that excuses, ex, making excuses is a route to failure. Um, so I hope not. I mean, we've got great players um, and I'm certain Conte 
Um, and with one or two additions, maybe three or four, um, I think Conte is going to transform his winning mentality uh, pretty much as Aussie did uh, and relay it into the boys and, and, and build them up. And I, it wouldn't surprise me to see come the end of this season that we win a trophy because Conte is a winner. Yeah, no, 100%. Conte is a winner. I, I definitely believe in, it's Conte, in Conte we trust over here. But um, Jack, I know you want to ask about Glenn Goddle. Yeah, Glenn Goddle. I mean, personally, being a younger fan myself, especially Mickey, you know, I feel like, you know, from what I've seen, actually, I'm not even kidding, since I obviously wasn't allowed to see him live or anything, still from the highlights and from the full matches that I've seen, one of the greatest players I've ever seen kick a football. But for what in you particular maybe made Glenn Goddle so great, you know, especially coming from such a technically gifted footballer like yourself, what made him so great? Um, I think that Glenn Odell is the most naturally gifted footballer that I've ever seen. Number one. Uh, he could do absolutely anything he wanted to do with the ball, with either foot, inside, outside, back, knee, bottom of the foot, top of the foot. He could deliver it with side spin, top spin, slice, draw, fade, whatever you want to do, he could do. He was total genius. Uh, and I genuinely believe if Glenn Odell had had half a yard more pace, he would have been the greatest footballer the world's ever seen. Because I've not come across, I've watched Messi, who I believe to be the greatest ever. Um, and he's an incredible footballer. Did he have the natural ability of Glenn Odell? Not in my mind. He was a better player than Glenn because he had attributes that Glenn didn't know. Um, but in terms of vision, awareness, passing ability, range of pass, individual skill, um, understanding of the game, know-how. Glenn Odell was... Uh, and, and, and just to emphasise this point, I'm going to tell you about a conversation I had with Steve Perriman recently. And he did a podcast where he spoke about Glenn Odell. And he said some of the greatest things about Glenn Odell anybody's probably ever said. And Glenn said, obviously heard about it. And Glenn went up to Steve and he said, Stevie, thanks so much for saying those lovely things about me. That He said, to have my captain, one of my heroes, saying those things about me was incredible. Do you know what Steve, he said? Steve, he said, Glenn, the biggest compliment I can ever give you is... If I ever come back in another life and be a professional footballer, I want to be Glenn Odell. Wow. And I think that sums it up how great Glenn Odell was, that everybody wanted to be Glenn Odell. The amount of people that say to me, I'm a Spurs fan because I fell in love with the way Glenn Odell played the game. You know, I, I, he was just pure genius. And the tragedy for me, the tragedy for me about Glenn Odell well, there's two tragedies. One, he should have had 150 England caps and been revered worldwide. Uh, but two, um, he... I forgot what I was going to say now. <laughs> do you feel like, just quickly as a follow-up, do you feel like, because what I've seen from full matches of him, you know, uh, back, you know, just re-watching those, he looked like the definition of somebody that could do whatever he wanted on the pitch just do whatever he wanted like just if you, you put know, the ball just think of something and do it put it this way you could hit the ball at any height or any pace that you wanted to hit it even if he was five yards away and he would find a part of his body to just cushion that ball no matter how high you hit the ball no matter how hard you hit it no matter how wide you hit it he would find a part of his body that would react instinctively and that would just absolutely cushion that ball to the exact point that he wanted the ball to be to do his next thing. And wow. most importantly was that Glenn Odell knew where everybody was on the pitch before he even got the ball. So yeah. he could hit passes. And you used to think, wow. I mean, I had me? great vision and awareness. But sometimes... I used to take my breath away 
some of the passes. Sometimes he did a pass. I was one day when I was 17 and I was watching him in the stand. And he hit this pass from sort of inside right, inside our own half, right? And he used to always hit this 40-yard crossfield pass into Tony Galvin's run, yeah? And he hit this pass, and for the life of me, he was pinging this 40-yard pass into Tony Galvin's run. But he did it with so much slice and curl that he faded it. Instead of it going right to left, it actually went right to right. He faded it that much with so much slice, and it just spun and checked stone dead into Steve Perryman's run down the right wing. And Stevie didn't even have to control the ball. He had stopped dead in his path, and he could just take it on. And it was one of the greatest passes that I've ever seen, but it said so much about, one, his awareness, but two, the, the technical ability he had, he had to be able to actually implement such a pass with so much skill and technique and, and flair and creativity. He was just an exceptional, exceptional talent. And, and may I say, as good a footballer as he was, he's a better human being. Yeah. Wow. That's that's ridiculous considering, like I said, also from what I've seen, he would hit it with a left foot sometimes. And I actually was convinced. I was like, he must be left footed as well yeah, at yeah. certain moments. So that's how ridiculous. I just didn't know what foot he was at a certain rate. You know, No, was he was ridiculously him. talented. When God handed out the talent, he gave him everything. <laughs> everything. Wow. And he deserved and, it because he's a wonderful human being. And, and, and Mickey, come here, tell me. Why do you think, in your opinion, Glenn Hoddle didn't get much uh, um, more England caps? What, was it because maybe he was ahead of his time, do you think? I think in that era, uh, football, English football was going through up and under um, and the hard-working, box-to-box, hard-tackling, uh, good in the air, midfielders were taking precedence. Um, it was Michelle Platini um, who mm. said... If Glenn Odell was French, he'd have 200 England caps. That's how good he was. Uh, a bit like Xavi and Paul Scholes. Xavi said that Paul Scholes is the most clever footballer I've ever played against. You know, uh, But in English football, sometimes, particularly our era, because uh, I was of a similar ilk to Glenn, we were frowned upon because they said, oh, he doesn't work hard enough. Oh, he doesn't put a foot in. Oh, he doesn't put his head in where it hurts. Um, but People who do that, the ones, of course, every team has a balance and every team needs someone who puts the foot in or puts the head in where it hurts. But ultimately, the match winners are the ones that can hit that pass through the eye of a needle to right. create a goal for someone or ping one into the top corner. They're the ones that win the games. They're the ones that make the difference. Glenn Odell was a total genius. Wow. Wow. Well, and Philip, I know you have a question. Yeah, this would be kind of a dream team question. But if Glenn had stayed on at Spurs for another year or 18 months, he would have been playing in the same team as Paul Gascoigne and Gary Lineker. Can you imagine that? Um, yes, I can imagine it. I, I think that um, Gascoigne was a fantastic footballer. Was he in the same league as Glenn Odell? No. I love Gaza. I, I, I would say he's been... He's, the arts of the nation took to Gaza. His tears in the 1990, 1990 World Cup um, wooed everyone. Um, he was a, he was a genius himself, um, <laughs> and it's often debated Gascoigne or Odell. Um, I think if you played with Glenn Odell, I played against Gaza on numerous occasions. Um, Thought he was a genius. Was he good as Glenn Odell? No. Glenn Odell was simply, for me, the greatest English footballer ever born. There you are. Wow. 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 You disagree with that? I know. And just final, just final, sorry. I know we're obsessing over this, but you, Ozzy, and Hoddle together, just such technically gifted players. Do you feel like you guys, in the way that you even played with each other, might have been... I don't know if you can comment on this, but a bit ahead of its time, maybe the way that you guys could play with each other. Yes, not a doubt. Um, it certainly was way ahead of that period. Right. Um, you know, we had the Graham, the Graham Taylor management, the the the, the Dave Bassett's, 
Wimbledon's and Watford's, and they were dominating the uh, um, the physical physical side of the game, uh, up and under, put them under pressure, kick them, um, uh, scare them off their games. Um, if if my eighty to eighty to eighty four team played in today's football, we would compete at the very pinnacle of the league. Uh, we would compete in the Champions League. We would have an opportunity to win. Um, every trophy going and um, that doesn't mean we would but we would be competing with the very very best because it was a very very special team and and, and that it had every base covered we had we hired a hard man um, we had yeah. pace we had clever men we had silent assassins people who could take the put the opponent out without the opponent even knowing you were a dirty player <laughs> <laughs> we had flair, we had creativity, we had goal scorers, we had pace up front, we had we had everything in that team. It was a brilliant, brilliant team, and 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 if we competed today, would be more successful because there's less physicality today as yeah. well. Probably mm. lose the ball even less, even though you guys couldn't have the ball taken off. One hundred percent. Well, if some of the teams that play today, they can keep the ball for 15, 20 passes. Wow, I mean, in our day, you were hounded off the park to get the ball back but we still kept the ball as long as we wanted um, wow. it was a very special team very special players I was blessed um, to come around in that era and play with um, for me these gods um, I was blessed um, you know I could have come around a different either era. I did I came around in my second stint and I played with Sheringham Klinsman Barmby Popescu Dermatrescu which was a great team, by the way. Great squad of players. Was it anywhere near the 80s team? Not even close. And, and, and just speaking on the 80s team, look, you you absolutely wonderful football inside. Unbelievable. But Mickey, how important are the dark arts as well to add to that, to be able to get you over the line? Well, uh, we've touched on it many times. The... the, the um... The, 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 the bad thing about creativity and flair is if you look it up in the dictionary, it's, it's very difficult to, to be creative all of the time. Yeah. Um, and maybe what stopped us winning the league is that we wanted to be creative 24-7. Um, and when, the, unfortunately, someone else is trying to stop you being creative from the opposition. So, And when your creativity is not actually working for you, that's when you needed a, 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 a something else. And some days we had that something else and some days we didn't because we persevered. We had this belief in the way we played the game and we played it come what may. Um, but looking back now in hindsight, if we developed uh, and accepted, well, hang on, this is not quite going our way today. It's that creative side, that flair side. It's not functioning properly because they're working hard to stop it. Right, let's dig in. Let's match them. Let's let's adapt to what they're doing, uh, and then maybe later on in the game we can get come back to the creative side. But we never we kept playing the way we played and in what we believed in, which was the Tottenham way. And maybe it cost us winning a title. We should have won two titles. Um, we didn't, and maybe that was the reason. Wow, jeez, wow. these are great quotes. These are great snippets. Yeah. But maybe we can keep on the same vein, though. Someone that you've already mentioned multiple times, Philip. I know you want to ask uh, Mr. Hazard about uh, Keith Birkenshaw. The great Keith, great manager. Uh, he's dour Yorkshire member. Was he? Was he? Was he a dour in real life? As he maybe came across on the screen at times. I'm not made yes. so successful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. he was. He's very dour, Keith. Um, he was again. He was a, a fantastic human being. Um, he really and genuinely had your interest as well as the club's interest at art. Um, he was absolutely um, very, very clever. Um, he, he, was he the best tactician that I've ever met? No. Um, what What did he do that was brilliant? Well, what he did that was brilliant. That it sort of, you know, if you've got weaknesses as an individual, then correct your weaknesses. So what Keith did was, he made Steve Perriman captain, who was tactically supreme. He, he signed Ozzy Ardiles, and, uh, who was tactically supreme. So any tactics that needed to be done on the pitch could be altered on the pitch because um, 
Keith was he was a brilliant man manager. He made you feel great, um, and he and, and he signed players that actually made the team great, gave them a winning mentality, but also uh, made them you know sign top class tactical, technically good footballers. So we were never found wanting tactically either. But he was a, 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 a absolute gentleman i must say an absolute gentleman i'd love you to meet him yeah it sounds like an underrated attribute actually what you yeah. just said the players that he signed you know just the fact that he knew what players to sign himself because nowadays we need directors of football and whatnot to do it but he knew exactly and what they players often signed the ones. <laughs> 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 um, but I think, you know, we wanted to talk about maybe a certain hard man or maybe two different hard men for yeah. this one, you know, going back to the dark arts, if you will, uh, Mickey, but, you know, maybe uh, Dave's going to ask this one. Yeah. So look, Steve Perryman, of course, you know, most appearances for the club, you have Graham Roberts, who was also so tough and fearsome, but what made Steve Perryman and Graham Roberts so fearsome and tough? But in, in actual fact that, I mean, you won't believe how different they were. Um, Graves, Graham still is today um, up and at them you know let's get up you know, the, the best way to describe Graham was he got released at Southampton when he was 16 um, went and played non-league for a little while eventually got signed by Spurs and the first time he came up against Southampton in a league game he said, he said to me he said to us all before the game just I'll, I'll, don't worry, I'll score it. He scored three. <laughs> That's Graham Roberts. You, you, you put something in his face, and and he has to rise to the bait. He's there, uh, and he was as hard a tackler as you'll ever ever see. And he wouldn't think twice about putting you in rose Um but he would do it, <laughs> and the old world would see him do it. Um, you knew when he was coming for you, you jumped um, because it, it was. That's how he was. He was he was up and at you and in your face and he'd tell you what he thought of you while he was doing it as well. Take that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, so, yeah. You wouldn't even know he was doing you. When he'd done you, you'd actually think he was. He didn't mean it. It was an accident. He was so clever and shrewd the way he did it. You know, the story about we were playing a game one day and there was a young boy making his debut and he was up against Miller and Roberts, and they were giving him such a hard time, um, really giving it to him. So he went over to um, Perryman's side, and Stevie says to the, the young boy, he said, listen, mate, let me give you a bit of advice. You've just been up against Roberts and Miller, and they have given it to you hard, really hard, mate. He said, but listen, you've brought yourself over here, he said, that's the worst thing you could have done. He said, but if you want to stay here, I'm more than happy to have you. He said, but do yourself a favour. He said, you see Chris Hewton on the other side of the pitch? He said, he's as gentle as a lamb. He said, he's a good player, but he's as gentle as a lamb. He won't kick you. He won't verbal you. He won't do you when you're not expecting it. he just compete fairly with you. He said, take yourself over there. He said, you'll have a much easier day than being over here with me. You know, <laughs> that was Steve Perryman. Uh, and, the, and the guy went over to Chris Hewton. <laughs> you know, um, Steve was silent assassin, baby-faced assassin. Um, uh -huh. You wouldn't know. I mean, in training sometimes, I used to think, sometimes he'd kick me and I used to think, did he mean that? Or was he just an accident? You know, because he, he'd look across at you after doing your and say, sorry, Bad, badly timed tackle, you know. Um, silent assassin, totally different. Um, absolute legend of a captain, as good as it comes, would be my all-time 11 as a captain. Um, wow. Totally different to Roberts in many ways. Roberts would be an up-and-at-them captain and lead from the front and, uh, and charge, um, whereas Perryman would be certainly silent in the background and just waiting for an opportunity to go bang. Take that. <laughs> but both brilliant players. Perryman uh, could also play multiple positions, though, as well, right? Yeah. Like, just you said, an absolute tactician as well as being a, an assassin as well. Well, in the a US tactician. final first leg over in Anderlecht, he played centre mid um, alongside yeah. me. Um, and he was equally as good and equally as influential. Um, and while 
later in his career, it wasn't obviously his preferred position because he'd got used to playing at the back rather than the hurry scurry of midfield. Um, but I, from the back, his his awareness of uh, the requirements of the game mm. was second to none. He could spot something going wrong, or or if something was going right, he could build on it. He was just exceptional. Wow. wow! There you are. There you are on Steve Perryman, everybody, and also as well as also the two, the hardest nails men. You know the absolute masters of the dark arts. <laughs> the absolute masters. I'm not one hundred percent. Mickey, just quickly, were you a, were you a bit of a master of the dark arts yourself? No, no, no. you didn't like the dark arts enough. More technical. I don't think I kicked anybody in my life. Uh, my <laughs> my mentality was: you can kick me as much as you want, but I'm going to outthink, I'm going to outskill, I'm going to outpass, and I'm going to outmaneuver you. Right. So if you want to quick me, kick me, you got to be good because I'm not going to be where, there when you kick me. Um, that was how I played the game. That's how I thought the game. I mm. always, I, I was a purist. I wanted to play the beautiful game. That doesn't mean I couldn't look after myself. Um, yeah. and it doesn't mean that if I had to take someone out, I wouldn't, but I would just be a clumsy takeout. Um, and I'd end up getting booked or sent off. Um, so I never really indulged in it. Um, because I always, if someone kicked me, I used to say, right, I'll nutmeg you now then, son. And I'd nutmeg them. <laughs> You know, um, so, no, I wasn't a dark arts man. I was as fair as they come. In fact, sometimes I would get tripped as I'm running through in the box and I wouldn't go down for a pen either. Um, I was, wow. you know, looking at it now, I was far too fair. <laughs> I wish I could turn <laughs> the clock back. Um, but, no, I, I, I would always try to outthink and outmaneuver them. Wow. Well, no, that's interesting because the reason why I ask is because me and myself, I'm a bit of a baller, Mickey, to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, once I once I was getting older and people are outgrowing me, I really had to learn. I had to look after myself. And then I really, really loved the dark arts of the game as well. So as that that's the only reason why I ask. But um, no, absolutely brilliant insight. And to any young person out there that's trying to make it in the game that maybe, you know, you, you're you not you're not maybe the most aggressive, you know, Take what Mickey has said here on board. Outsmart them, out yep. them, and outmaneuver them. Absolutely, Absolutely. brilliant words. Absolutely, Absolutely brilliant words. But Jack, I believe you have another question. Yeah, maybe a bit more of an uncomfortable one. But, you know, in September 85, Mickey, you were sold to Chelsea for around 300000 You mean, how did this even come about? How did leaving Spurs come about, if you will, um, if you're comfortable? To be totally and utterly honest, I didn't know how it came about because <laughs> normally when you... Um, you read in the papers, you know, obviously I'm not talking about small speculation every week. There's, uh, right. there's news about players. <laughs> but you normally get to hear about something if it's about to happen. But I had no inclination. We played Newcastle at White Hart Lane. We won 5-1. I scored in, in the 5-1 victory. I was in the players' lounge after the game celebrating. Peter Shreves calls me out of the dressing room. Uh, oh, sorry, at the players' lounge, and, and says, "Look, Mickey, I've got a, this. Is not my decision. It's the chairman's Irvin Scholar. He's accepted a record bid off Chelsea, a record Chelsea bid of three hundred and fifty thousand um, for you. And he set up a meeting with their manager on Monday. Um, now you have to remember, I'd, I'd sort of won cups. I'd been picked for England at every level. Um, I love Spurs. I knew nothing else." Um, from the moment that I left school. To be told that you surplus to requirements is, is, and I'd only just signed a four-year contract, which compounded it, compounded the misery, if you like. Nice um, so I was in shock. I, I, I left the stadium immediately. I drove down Tottenham High Road to my house, um, feeling complete devastation. Right. But pretty much... My mentality was, um, can I swear? Yeah, swear yes. all you want. <laughs> I was going to say. My mental, I'm my mentality, swear words over here. As I got in my house, my, my, my mentality was, fuck them, I'm going nowhere. Fuck them. They That's can like fucking do all they want to do for me. I'm not moving. And um, all weekend, I, I, I was fuming the whole weekend. Um, but adamant, adamant, I'm going nowhere. 
out of respect, I went to the meeting on the Monday. I met John Hollands in Uatel, who was the Chelsea manager. Um, he offered me a £400 a week wage rise. Remembering I'd only just signed a four-year contract at, at Spurs, so I'd, I'd gone up to a lot more money. Um, and he offered me a £400 a week wage rise. He offered to pay all my removal expenses. And he gave, he offered me a sponsored car as well, so I got a car for free. Um, that was a bonus. I wasn't even interested. I just couldn't wait to get out of the meeting. And then he said to me, on top of all the things that we've offered you, if you put your name on this contract before we leave this hotel today, then we will transfer £100,000 into your bank account tomorrow. Wow. So I said, where do I sign, John? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I signed, right? And, yeah. then, and of course... In the next day, I've got one hundred thousand pounds in my account. But um, so we train at Heathrow. Um, Ten thirty start. I've no idea how long it's going to take me from Tottenham to Heathrow to to train. So I left home at half six. I got to Heathrow Airport at half seven. Not we don't train till half ten. So I'm sat in the car park waiting for everybody to arrive from half seven. And all I can think of is, what the heck have I done? And I made yeah. a decision that, that morning to never, ever make money a priority in any decision that I ever make footballistically again wow. because I instantly regretted it. Um, I wished I could turn the clock back 24 hours because every player came in and we're all in the changing rooms and they were all out on the training, train, training pitch at, for 10.30 start. And I was still sitting in my car. I didn't actually want to go in because it was... I, I knew I'd made a bad decision. I, I should have been a, a one-club-only man. That's the type of person I am. Um, I should have been a Ledley King. Um, and I spent the next three months at Chelsea willing Spurs to re-sign me. And on three separate occasions, they tried to. Um, Aben sold me for three hundred and fifty thousand. They they offered Chelsea fifty thousand for me three times. Obviously, Chelsea <laughs> turned it down. Um, but when I look back, um, while I played very well at Chelsea, the Chelsea fans adored me. Um, my heart was. That doesn't mean I never gave my all for Chelsea. I did. In fact, I actually scored two goals against Tottenham at White Hart Lane in a three-one win. Um, so I did give my all for the club, but I never, my heart was never, was never a Chelsea player's. It was always a Spurs player. Uh, and I loved the Chelsea fans because they sang my name 24-7. Whenever I was playing, it was my name. So I, I love and respect them because of that. Um, but the actual club uh, never felt part of my heart. Uh, my heart was always back at White Hart Lane. Um, and I spent most of my life, I've been left Spurs, um, wishing I was back there until finally at the age of 33, it, was, it wasn't it was happening and it was too late. I'd given up, I, I was never going to go back, I was too old. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, I'm signed for Spurs yeah. Yeah. and I got back to Spurs. So I thought to myself, why didn't I wish it was over earlier? Um, you know, so I, I got, I eventually got back. Um, and spent the last two years of my career um, at Spurs. And, and then um, Jerry Francis came in. He was never going to rebuild or build the team around me because I was 35 now. Um, so I knew my days were numbered. So I decided to retire. I had offers from other clubs to go and play for them. But I thought, no, started at Spurs. I'm going to retire at Spurs. Um, I retired, went into the coaching staff at the academy, in the academy, Spent 10 years coaching there and, and uh, I've spent a total of about 42, 40, about 40 years uh, working in some form of capacity at Spurs now. So um, it's been amazing. Wow. Great answer. Great answer. I'm also just quickly quite surprised that you had no idea about the move originally. Not, and there, you know, Fabrizio not, Romano, you I know, telling. Tell you, and I was also, <laughs> they also told me that if I didn't leave, I'd never play for Spurs again. No wow. way. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I would have. I would have. 
that, that, that yeah. that's always a threat to get you to want to go because I don't want to spend my life in the reserves. I was far yeah. too good for that. So um, it's a threat that probably I'll never know whether they would have adhered to it or not. Yeah. 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 No, 100%. I doubt they would have, to be honest with you. But, Philip, you know, have you anything there you want to ask, uh, ask Mickey? Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, you know, if Spurs wanted to buy you back so quickly after selling you, did they realise that they'd made, they'd made a huge mistake? You know, what was the thinking behind that? Well, I think that they, they did make a huge mistake. And the reason they made a huge mistake was because at that stage, Glen Odelu was, um, I was probably the nearest player to Glen Odelu in the English game. Um, was on the verge of leaving um, and going abroad. Um, so, how do you replace Glenn Odell? Well, I'd replaced them on numerous occasions during the, the course of my time at Spurs and certainly in the UEFA Cup run, for instance. Um, mm. Glenn wasn't there and, and obviously we didn't miss him as much as we could have because I was around. So, I was the ideal replacement for Glenn. Um, but they sold me uh, and then Glenn left and, and they never really found anybody in, in the, at that time that could replace, maybe not replace them fully, but could 90% replace them. Um, so, yeah, I think they, they made a mistake. Uh, but I think that they had cash flow problems at the time, so they needed the cash that Chelsea supplied. Uh, and then they were just trying it on to get me back for 50 grand, which would have kept them the cash, uh, the, 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 the 300,000, which would have helped with their cash flow problems. Yeah, right, right. Interesting, interesting. I think Graham Roberts had a similar issue. He was more or less sidetracked as well when David Pleat came in, wasn't he? Same, exactly. Yeah. Very similar story, not, not quite as... Um, I suppose in many ways it was, Graham was told... That was surplus the requirements in 1986, 87. Um, and when he went to pick up his boots, there was a, a kit bag with his boots outside the main gates waiting for him. Oh, um, so, yeah, listen, the one thing you must understand by football is it's cutthroat. When you know, yeah. when you surplus the requirements, you surplus the requirements. There's nothing you can do about it. And that doesn't mean that they don't make a bad decision. It don't, doesn't mean that they won't sign you back if they realise they made a bad decision. Um, but if they decide that you're going, you're going. Um, and and uh, as, as Graham found out, as other players have found out over time, um, there's nothing you can do. You, you end up going. Um, so, yeah, it's sad, but it's a fact of life. And I think as footballers, you know that is the case. So... Mm you sort of accept and understand it. Um, that doesn't mean you agree with it. It just means that you can, you know, it, it might one day come. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. Brilliant answer. But Mickey, you, you, you mentioned the um, uh, coaching in the academy for Spurs. What does it take um, for a youngster to get through the academy and into the first team? Hard work, talent, <laughs> Look, a manager that loves you um, and is prepared to give you the time to... Because some young players don't take to it straight away. Um, maybe they haven't got the personalities, the character yet at such a young age to go in and take it by storm. Uh, sometimes um, they take a lot longer to develop. You look at Harry Kane, for instance, he went on loan, what, six, seven times, seven yeah. different clubs um, in his quest to break through. And uh, and in the end, he developed the, the personality and the character to to be the, one of the best in the world. So um, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, some it does, um, some it doesn't. Um, it. What I will say is, you know, some of the advice that I got along the way, you know, one of the best pieces of advice was from Glenn Oddle, for instance. Mickey, never do the same thing twice. Because I was skillful, tricky. Never do the same thing twice. And what he meant by that was, look, when you're a kid, you can do the same thing 50 times and get away with it. Yeah. Because you're playing against kids who've got no discipline or no organisation, no understanding. 
when you get to the age of 16, you're playing the youth team, you get away with it 15, 20 times in the game because they're still, they're still learning the game. When you play in the reserves, you might get away with it three or four or five times. But when you get to the very top of the game, once you do the skill once, the next time they're expecting it again. Mm. So do something different. So faint to do that first skill, but then do something different um, so that they never know what you're going to do. And I thought it was great advice. And it's the same. Yeah. You, and the other bit of advice is, look, there's only so many skills that you've got. You know, there's not uh, there's not a world of, you know, I'm talking about playing skills. I'm not talking about trickery and and being a clown and and, and a, a juggler. I'm yeah. talking about game things that you can do on a football. There's only so many you've got, right? So let's just for argument's sake say there's ten different skills that you can do, yeah. But if you master them with both feet, that means you've got twenty different skills. Um, and while they're both the same skills, the fact that you can do it one with your left foot, 10 with your left, 10 with your right creates 10 diff 20 different opportunities of doing 20 different skills. Because if you throw your foot over the left, the top of the ball with your left foot and take it away with the outside of your right, the player you're playing against thinks that's your skill. But then all of a sudden you throw the top of your right foot over the ball and take it away with the outside of your left. It's a totally different skill and a totally different movement. So you're opening up gates that you can burst through with different skills, with the same skill, but did on different feet. So master the ball with both your feet. Sounds like something you and Glenn Hoddle definitely live by. I can tell you. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Live, by it. <laughs> love that. I absolutely love that. And seriously, I mean, that just makes complete sense that you guys live by that. Um, but I, you know, maybe going to take you down a bit more of a comedic patch and, pick any story that you know maybe comes to mind you know and honestly you know there's really no filter here so whatever your favorite is what is the funniest story or prank maybe that you have played yourself or maybe someone else like an Aussie or someone or a Steve Perryman played uh during your days with Spurs um well the funniest story it's a bit rude a bit rude. Not We're it's ready for it. We're ready the for funniest it. story that I mean, as a 16 year old boy starting out at Spurs full time, I I literally was one of the quietest, shyest boys you'd ever meet. Meet, and I would spend the end of training waiting for all of the first thing to vacate the training ground to actually go and have a a bath, and then. Um, this particular day, I actually misjudged it, didn't I? Because I didn't want to talk to the first team. I was too shy. So it was all silent. So I made my way into, into where the bath is. I went to climb into the bath. Who's sitting in the bath? Steve Perriman, John <laughs> Pratt, and Peter Taylor. Three of the three most experienced players in the club at that time. Uh, can I turn back and walk out? No, because it looks a bit silly because I've got no clothes on. <laughs> uh, so get, attempting to jump into the bath and then turning away and walking away sort of would have been more embarrassing. So I proceeded and I got into the bath and, and I sat down. Now I presume, and I don't know, but I presume that there was a signal between the three of them because they knew I was very quiet and very shy and I, I wouldn't speak to them. And, and John Pratt suddenly stood up and he stood right in front of me. And he had a bit of bath soap in his hands and he was washing his chest and washing his belly and putting it down his thighs and underneath his bollocks and round his backside. And he was washing his wear for about five minutes, just washing them right in front of my face. <laughs> right? And he's doing it all this. And then all of a sudden, he bent over. And this is football banter. It's football jokes. And this is the way footballers behave. And he bent over right in front of my face. And he pulled his bum cheeks apart. And he said, Mickey, is it clean up there or what? <laughs> and stupid, stupid idiot Mickey said, I, I had a look. I went, yeah, John, it's clean. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's how shy I was. Is it clean up there, Mickey? Oh, Looks yeah, good John, to me. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was clearly a joke, clearly a bit of banter, clearly done to embarrass me. A stupid idiot, I was so shy, was saying, yeah, John, it's clean. <laughs> I mean, come on, who does that? Who looks good to me? i got to tell you, my face was burning with, you know, I went bright red, I was burning. Yeah. I was, honestly, I it was one of too. the funniest things. <laughs> Uh, and when I tell a story on Legends Nights, when I do a Legends Night and I'm asked the question, what's the funniest thing? Sometimes I tell that one. There's lots of funny things. You can tell so many stories. Um, but that one was just embarrassing. But when I think about it now, I think about my embarrassment, but I think about the situation that I found myself in that I couldn't get out of. And now they could think of such a thing to actually embarrass me. It really makes me laugh today. Creative players, creative jokes, Mickey, huh? Yeah, exactly. Well, Jimmy Greaves comes out one one as well. I was I was with Jimmy's son recently at a, a Q and A, uh, and Danny Danny Greaves. He says to me, yeah. "I said, Jim, I said, Danny, I said, did Jimmy ever suffer from loss of confidence?" He said, "You know what, Mick?" He said, "I spoke to him just the other week, and I said to him, Dad, did you ever lose confidence? Did you?" What was the worst thing that ever happened to you in football? Jimmy said, to be honest with you, he said, nothing nothing bad happened to me. He said, what about when you were on a gold drought? And Jimmy went, oh, when I was on a gold drought, that was the worst fucking 15 minutes of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> what a player. What, what a player. player. What a Last. player. What a human being. Yeah. Oh, that's absolutely top jaw. That is top jaw. I, I still can't. I'm going to, anytime I even hear that when it comes to the kitchen counter and my missus or something says, you know, it's a clean up there, you know, I, seriously, I'll never forget that. Well, you can imagine that this, this was uh, 45 years ago, 45 and a half years ago that that happened. And yet I still remember it as if it happened yesterday. <laughs> I remember it's that time. I've still got this picture of John's bum. <laughs> oh my god. Oh oh, that's god. absolutely quality. Yeah, that is hilarious. Still Any clean to this funny... day. <laughs> Any more funny stories like that before we move on, Mickey? Uh, the one about Pat Jennings and Bill Nicholson. Pat Jennings, best goalie in the world. Yeah. Mm. Playing in the first team regularly. He's on 40 quid a week, 30. Thirty pound, uh, thirty pound um, salary, ten pound appearance money, and all the boys are winding them up, and they're saying, "You got to get in and ask for a rise." So, honestly, seeing Bill Nicholson, oh god, it was a nightmare. It was scary, you know, just sitting talking to him because he had this elevated table, so you used to have to look up to him. It was oh, it was... so Pat knocks on the door. Bill says, "Yeah, who's that?" It's Pat Jennings. I said, what do you want? He said, I need to have a word with you, Bill. So Bill, got, Pat goes in, sits down. Bill says, what's up, Pat? He said, look, I, you know, Bill, I'm, I'm playing for Northern Ireland. I'm generally regarded as one of the best goalies in the world. Uh, most of the first team are more, on more money than I am. He said, and I'm, I'm coming in to, for a rise. So Bill Nicholson says to them, well, Pat, tell me how much you're earning. What, what, what are you on now? He said, well, I'm on 40 quid, Bill. He said, I'm on £30 salary, uh, £30 a week, and £10 appearance money. So Bill says, OK. He said, let me go home tonight, have a think about it, come back and see me tomorrow, and I'll sort something out. And Bill, oh, thank you, Bill, I really appreciate it. So the next day, Pat goes back, knocks on the door, walks into to Bill's room, sits down, looking up at Bill. Bill says, uh, yeah, what do you want, Pat? He said, well, you told me to come back for... You know, because we were discussing. Oh, Bill went, oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot. He said, yeah, Pat. He said, I thought about it last night, and I'm going to give you a rise. He said, oh, that's brilliant, Bill. Thank you. He said, can you remind me how much you were on? He said, I'm on £30 a week, Bill, and £10 appearance money. And Bill says, well, Pat, I'm going to give you a rise. He said, I'm going to give you £35 a week and £5 appearance money. <laughs> <laughs> and Pat signed it. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. Well, that was Bill. Bill Nicholson tread the club's money like it was his own, yeah. you know. Wow. And he wouldn't part with it for nobody. He was he was amazing, Bill. Um, but Pat Pat tells the story, and when Pat tells it, he tells it for real because he was there. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> he took it. <laughs> no, that's absolutely brilliant. Uh, but Philip, 
I believe you have the last question before we open up to the viewers out there. Yeah. Um, you know, this is kind of close to me heart because I was over at the game against Norwich on Sunday there and I thought the, the, the fans' reaction in the new stadium was immense. When you were playing with them, you know, did the, did the Spurs fans obviously gave you great support? But did that, inf did that drive you forward in some matches? You know, like you might, things aren't going so well and the fans get behind you. Does that help a player? Did that, that help you to improve your performance in a particular match? It shouldn't do. It shouldn't do. Um, and let me explain what I mean by that. Um, I think the fans, not just the Tottenham, but any football club, play an incredible part in any success of any football club that's ever been. In, in, in fact, I go as far as to say is that the fans actually are the football club. Without the fans, there's no football club. Um, and the fans support their football club unconditionally. You know, players, they come and go. Uh, chairman come and go, uh, managers come and go, but fans, they're there through thick and thin and, and they do it while spending vast amounts of money to do it. So they are unbelievably important in a football club, unbelievably. Can they lift you? Absolutely, they can lift you. They can turn um, a poor performance into a great performance, a poor result into a great result. Should it, should they have that impact? No. Uh, while the impact that they have is a necessity, uh, and of course nobody ever wants to change uh, the fans and the way they um, sing your name or or get behind the team or do that because it's 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 wonderful. But as an individual, as a player, I always maintain that, um, and it's advice that I gave to youngsters when I was coaching at Tot Tottenham. Mm -hmm. I used to, listen, guys. Have an inner belief in yourself so that success or failure doesn't make you better or worse. Because just as praise, which is success, just as praise will lift you, if you allow praise to lift you, then criticism will knock you. It'll put you down. Mm -hmm. So if you have an inner belief whereby you are on an even level, Bump, 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 all the way. That success, a bad pass, uh, doesn't knock you, or a mm. good pass doesn't lift you. Um, if you are on this even key, that like you, you don't let negativity or positivity have an effect on you because you have this belief in yourself. Then you are relying on nothing but yourself, um, and all the outside things like the fans singing, like the great pass, like the goal you score, like this, like. They're all wonderful things, wonderful things. Um, but my my point being is, is that no matter how great that is, if you allow that to be your confidence, then that day when you're having a stinker and they're getting on your back or the t or your bad passing's not there or they're shooting at goals off target, that's going to knock your confidence. Mm. So don't rely on someone singing your name to feel good. Don't rely on mm -hmm. a great pass to feel good. Rely on... Uh, your inner self to feel good and don't let a bad pass or someone booing you because opposition always boo you um, don't let those things have a negative impact on the way you see yourself um, and that's why um, I, I, I preached to youngsters to have an inner belief and inner confidence in yourself that won't doesn't, doesn't allow success or failure to dictate how you feel um, and that's not detracting from anything or any part that something that you do in the game plays. Uh, a great pass, a great shot, a great dribble, a great chip, a great save, uh, a, a great sing song that the fans sing about you. That all has a massive impact. Hmm. But you but that, shouldn't that let it impact fun. too much. Otherwise, you end up, when, it, when they're not doing that, impacting it in a negative way. But that, that must have come, you, you must have been self-taught on that, because back in the day when you were playing, the, the club wouldn't have been employing any psychologists. No, to, no, it's something, that that I, it's something that I greatly believe in, and, and I learned from myself was that, I probably learned it from my own self, from my own playing career, because I, I used to find ways of why when I'm brilliant, I'm a brilliant, and why when I'm crap, I'm a crap. 
Yeah. What makes me crap? What makes me brilliant? And one day later in my life, I, I came across a poem and it said, if, it's called If. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah. yeah. It's Rid Rudyard Kipling. That's if. It. And one of the lines in this uh, poem is, Don't let success or failure, failure lift or knock you. Yeah, meaning exactly what I've just said. You yeah, don't yeah. don't mm. rely on don't rely on praise to uplift you. Mm. You should be able to uplift yourself because if if praise is uplifting you, then criticism is going to knock you, um, yeah. and not, not, none of them should have so much of an influence over how you feel. And it's something that I, I believe in greatly um, because you take a podcast, for instance, what we're doing now, this, yeah. this show. Um, I could come on here and I could stutter and stammer to, for whatever reason, um, I maybe get lost for a word or I can't find a word and I get stuck. Um, and suddenly you lose confidence in what you're doing because you've had a failure. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly you're fluent in a story and you get confident because you're telling it great and people are laughing, so you feel uplifted. I don't feel neither. I don't get uplifted by a great story. I don't get knocked by a cock-up because I believe that, I have an inner belief that I'm an interesting person. What I have to say is uh, you can listen to, listen to, and it's up to you whether you like what I say or whether you don't, but, it, but whether you like it or you don't like it won't affect how I tell it because I don't let outside influences knock or lift my confidence. Wow. Wow. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely wow. brilliant piece of life advice there as well wow. for, for anybody out there. Absolutely amazing piece of life advice. But look, guys, before we do open up now for um, um, for you guys out there that's viewing in to, to get your questions in, there is 160 is watching right now. So, um, look, do get your questions in the chat. If you want to put it in in a super chat, um, uh, feel free to do that. But before we do, uh, Mickey, I have a question from my old lad, and he wants to know who is the toughest player you came up against. The toughest player I ever played against was Ozzy Ardiles. Oh. Wow, <laughs> he was right. clever. What made him so he, clever? He was clever. He, he knew my every move. He was two steps ahead of the game. Everywhere I went, he was there waiting. Every trick I tried, I used I sat in the dressing room thinking he knows my game off by heart. He's gonna do he's gonna be everywhere I wanna go, he's gonna be there. So I'm gonna go somewhere different. Little did I know he was sitting in the dressing room next to me, playing against me, saying he's a clever player, this Mickey. He knows where he goes, I'm gonna be there. Uh, and he knows whatever trick he tries, I'm I'm gonna be ready for it. But he's clever, he's gonna change what he does. And he was waiting for me to change. So whatever I did, he was there waiting. He was unbelievably tough to play against. Wow. Those are well, too much mind that. games for me. That I would be demoralized by that. I'd be demoralized <laughs> by that. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. So he's absolutely delighted. He's a big fan of Ozzy Adiles as well. But Mickey, Paul Markey says here, Mickey is a Spurs legend, but does he have any thoughts on another wizard who preceded him, the marvelous Alfie Khan? Alfie Con was, um, you know what, I've met, met Alfie on a few occasions um, since he retired in the last three or four years. I did a Q&A with him. And one of the things I was so excited to be interviewing him. And I thought, I can't wait to talk about the moment that he sat on the ball um, against the great Leeds United team of the 70s. And he sat on the ball. So he was, as a that. player, he was incredibly flamboyant, incredibly confident, long, long flowing air, looked, looked just like he was born to be a top-notch footballer. When I asked him this question about sitting on the ball, uh, I thought he was going to, if, if he was asking the question to me, Mickey, when you sat on that ball against that great Leeds team, <laughs> how did it feel? I would have said, listen, I sat on the ball because I wanted them to know that they didn't intimidate me. They weren't going to get that ball off me. Come and have a go, because when you lunge to get it, I'm not going to be here. 
I'd have been socks down, shirt out. Come and get it. Come on, come on. You know, that's how I would have described it. So I said to Alfie, I said, Alfie, I've been waiting years to ask you this question. I said, you sat on the ball against that Billy Bremner, Johnny Giles. I mean, unbelievable, great players, but hard as nails as well. I said, tell me about it. He went, yeah, I sat on the ball. It was great. That was it. <laughs> didn't prolong his answer. Didn't. I'd, I'd waited years to ask him this question. And he just said, yeah, it was great. So off the pitch, he was totally unflamboyant as against what he was on the pitch. And he totally played it down. He totally didn't expand on it. Me, I would have wanted to talk about it all night because yeah. it would have been something that, you know, sometimes I used to have my pads my so pads out, socks down, my shirt out, and I'd stand there on the ball and I'd say, you want it, come and get it, you know? I'd be there arrogant. It gave me a sense of confidence. You can't get this ball off me. I've, if you sit on the ball, you've got to be some kind of confident player. Yeah. Later in life, you didn't even expand on it. <laughs> I had to think of another question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but absolutely brilliant answers today are Paul Mark, Mark I hope you enjoyed that my man uh, Tottenham Tantrum Gold uh, uh, Mickey I think you might actually be familiar with this page or, or this YouTube channel um, he says I cried and cheered when you came back and uh, thank you Mickey for all the years at Spurs you were and um, you were um, I think he's saying, I cried when you left and cheered when you came back. Thank you, Mickey, for all the years at Spurs uh, you were. And to watch you play was an absolute yeah. joy. What was Ozzy and Glenn like to play under? Come on, you Spurs. To play under? Um, <laughs> very, very difficult. <laughs> play alongside, I guess. First of all, thank you for the wonderful message. Um, incredible. Um, and, and, and lovely to know that many, many years later, you still thought of and still appreciated. Um, that means a lot. Um, what were they like to play under? Very difficult. It's very hard to play under one, your heroes. Um, yeah. And two, um, your friends. Um, I had many a row with Ozzy. Many a row. We were best friends. We were room partners. And, and even when I joined Swindon, I played. Un I lived in the same house as Ozzy. <laughs> so we rowed lots uh, because... I could never understand because obviously, obviously Ozzy had to, he had to set the example in front of all the other players, and often would choose me of to, to use his authority. Yeah. So that everybody else, well, if he's not afraid of Mickey, then he's not afraid of us. Um, and I would go back at him and have a big full scale row with him in front of the other players, you know. So uh, looking in hindsight, I was wrong. He was right. Um, Glenn, um, pretty much similar. The problem. The problems I had with Glenn was that I held him in the highest of high esteem. You've probably gathered that, uh, the way I talk yeah. about him. He was a fantastic human being also. Um, so um, having your friend and hero telling you to do something, and if you don't do it, then telling you off, is actually very, very tough to take. Yeah. Um, I found... Footballistically, it was amazing playing under both of them. Um, they both tactically were brilliant. They both wanted to play attacking the football, the beautiful game. It was a dream come true to be playing under them. But off, but but in training and and, and sometimes at off time, um, it was very hard when your friend, your hero, is having to tell you things that you're not maybe doing or should be doing. Um, that was tough to take. Uh, yeah. Because you wanted them to say great things about you, um, but they weren't. They were saying, uh, "Mickey, you haven't did this." Or you. And I, some, one game, I was having an absolute stormer, uh, and they were saying, "Mickey, you, you know, you, you haven't made any tackles." Oh, have I not? And, and yet it's sort of because they were your. It's a bit like your dad having a go at you. Really, that's how yeah. it felt when your dad has a go at you. It sort of upsets you because you hang on, you don't have a go at your son. Um, but Glenn and Ozzy were like fathers to me, so um, <laughs> it was very hard to uh, very, yeah. not hard, sorry, that's the wrong word. It was very different, very, yeah, very yeah. different, more different than any managers that I worked under. Um, because if they something, I'd have a row, I'd have a row with them and, and it would be gone. But with Glenn and Ozzy, um, it was very difficult be, or different because hang on, we're best mates, <laughs> we shouldn't be rowing, so yeah. strange, uh -huh. but. Incredible to play in their teams. Incredible.
to ride with your hero. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. know what that'd be like. I couldn't ever imagine. Unbelievable, unbelievable. But um, look, I think there's a lot of people putting in the same question, Mickey. And look, they want to know what's your thoughts on the current Tottenham team and uh, who is your favourite uh, player? The current Tottenham team is is a work in progress. Um, I think that we missed an incredible opportunity two or three years ago under Pochettino uh, when I thought we were a really good side um, and maybe one or two players away from um, winning the title, um, winning the Champions League. I felt we were so close. Um, as was proved, we finished second in the league and, and we got to the Champions League final. We were wonderful. Um, if someone had said to me that if Pochettino was going to leave, you're going to get Jose Mourinho, I would have said, wow, what a move, getting the manager who's won 25 trophies. Incredible. Uh, unfortunately, it was a bad fit. Uh, the way that he preached the game didn't fit the way that Spurs are renowned for playing the game. That was yeah. a bad fit. And then, of course, they brought Nuna in on the back of that, more because they couldn't get the, 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 the people that they wanted. Nuno was a bit of a... Um, played not dissimilar to Mourinho. So, again, he wasn't a great fit. Um, this guy coming in now, Conte, I think he's going to be a revelation. His passion, his desire, his intensity is phenomenal. In fact, I find myself sometimes just watching him and not the game um, <laughs> because it's such an education watching him on the side of the pitch. Um the team itself, the team's got a way to go to find its way back to um, where we were a couple of years ago. Um, and I think that we will need to make signings to um, transform this team um, into... Because we've got the makings of a very, very, very good team. Um, you know, the most difficult part of the game is scoring goals. And we've got top footballers who score lots of goals. Um, so we haven't got to find that part of the game. It's there already. Um, but I, I've i got incredibly high hopes of Conte. And I think that if he can rebuild one or two of the players who have been very good players in the past and maybe have just let, allowed themselves to, to lose a little bit of confidence or, or, or whatever, or lose a little bit of form, um, you hope that either they rebuild themselves or Conte helps rebuild them. Um, and then we make one or two really top-notch additions to the squad, then I think we can go places again because we're not too far off, um, but it's still a long road. Um, we're not we're not even close to being where we should be at this moment in time. Um, but I think that this time next year, under Conte, I really believe that this team will go places. Wow. I love that. Uh, do you know what? I actually said this on the watch along the other day we done for the uh, Norwich victory. I said, you know, if, if we get top four this season, I'd be running out next season to put a fiver on Tottenham winning the league uh, the following season because I yeah. believe we do great things with this current squad. And look, there is loads of questions. Just just maybe quickly, what's your opinions on, on Harry Kane right now? You know, sometimes I feel very sorry for Harry because he's such a yeah. great, great, great player. Um, but... He never gets any rest whatsoever. He plays year in, year out. Through. He never gets a break because he's England and the UA, uh, European Championships, the World Cup, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so at some stage, the body needs a rest and, and the mind, even more importantly, needs yeah. a, a bigger rest. Yeah. And sometimes I look at Harry and I feel like he looks a bit fatigued mentally. Um, there's been signs that he's rediscovering his form. Um, he's, you know, he's having little moments in the games where I think, wow, he's back on song. I mean, a couple of passes at the weekend there. He, you know, when he chipped the keeper, Harry at his very best would would have yeah. put that in the back of the net. Yeah. Um, but listen, form, form is uh, form is what's the word? Temporary. Temporary. Temporary class is permanent. Harry's yeah. class. He'd be back, um, and. He's still a massive influence on our team, even despite the fact that he's not scoring goals. He still has a major part to play because he'll occupy two or three players and it'll allow someone else to, to find space right. and score the goal. Um, so, um, But we need him at our best. If we're going to go and win trophies um, this season or, or next, we need Harry Kane at his very best. Yeah. And who's your favourite player currently, maybe just quickly, in the squad? 
If you um, have to pick one, maybe you don't have one. I love Sonny. I think he's very exciting, and I, lo I love people who play the game with a smile on their face. I, Deli Ali was my favourite until he, he sort of lost his way. Um, I can't figure out why he's lost his way. He's a shadow of the player that he was, but I, I don't want the club to sell him because I think that he's a kind of player that can make our team better. And if we fight, if we rebuild him uh, and he rediscovers himself and his, his passion for the game, um, then he can add something to our team, which we have is not part of our team at this moment. That that yeah. eye of the past, that that creativity, that flair, that playing with a smile on your face. Um, because when he was at his best in the put in the Pochettino era, he was different class. I love yeah. watching him play. So I hope that he rediscovers himself first, because that's the route to success. Uh, but if not, then someone else from along the way rediscover himself. Yeah, great answer. Hold well on. Uh, William Kelly says, Mickey, who is the closest player to your style after you were finished your playing career that you thought, yeah, he reminds me of me? What, for Spurs? Uh, well, it could be for Spurs or anybody, really. Uh, he hasn't he hasn't really made it specific. I would have to say that um, without any bias whatsoever, I think probably the one who plays most like me in modern in the last 15 years and is... is um, obviously watched me and learned from me must be Lionel Messi. <laughs> <laughs> He's taking a few pages out of yours. He's taking a few pages out of yours. No, I, I, I would say Paul Scholes. Uh, Paul Scholes reminded me of me and the way that I played the game. I, maybe um, he scored more goals than me, but I had more um, individual skill, I ability mm. to beat players. But he reminded me a bit of me. Um uh, and and if you if you wanted to choose a Spurs player, then Ericsson to a degree he couldn't dribble like I could dribble, uh, but he reminded me with his eye for a pass, uh, a bit of me. Love yeah, that. great answer. Yeah, great yeah. answer. Great answer. Moon Dog says here, thank you, Mickey, for some great memories. I have been supporting Spurs since 1967. No question whatsoever. He just wants to say thank you for giving up your time this evening. So no, it's my Moondog. pleasure. My pleasure. And um, we have a couple more here. Alexander Hilton, he wants to know, do you think you'd start in this current team, Mickey? Um, it's, it's easy for me to say yes. Um, because I have not a doubt that I would. Um, but ultimately, it would be the manager's decision. But I find it hard to believe that I wouldn't be in our team. I, I think this manager would worship me. Love it. I absolutely love that. Love it. Kenny, Kenny, uh, what was your favourite game you were ever part of? Um, from an individual perspective, I would have to say the semi-final of the UEFA Cup. I scored the winning goal. I lost the contact lens uh, in the process. Went left the pitch to put it back in. And as I came back up the tunnel... Um, into the view of the fans, they sang my name. Obviously, I'd just got the winning goal to put us in the UEFA Cup final, so I was a bit of an hero. And it was a moment that was specially reserved for me. Um, but the final, I think, the the, the final at um, White Hart Lee and the, the last le second leg, uh, I think that very, very difficult to, to surpass that. Um, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, in fact, I wish it was yesterday uh, because I could sit and just bask in the glory of it all. Um, it was wonderful. It really was. And I, the, the, the UEFA Cup final would be my greatest football memory from a playing perspective. Wow. Wow. So there you are, Kenny and Kenny. There's, there, there's the answer to your question, my man. And I hope you're keeping well. Uh, Mark Cousins, he wants to know what's your thoughts on Gary Mabs and Mark Falcao? Mark Falco. Well, I thought that um, Gary Mabbitt, I, I have to say, is what I call a walking miracle. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. When I when I look at Gary and what he's achieved in the game, I would say that Gary took his talent and maximised it to the full. Not many players do that, uh, but Gary did. Um, he fulfilled the very last ounce of talent that his body had to, to be what he is. 
and and, and doing it with a, an illness like diabetes, um, yeah. which was sort of very re- unknown quantity in our day, yeah. and certainly I'd never experienced it uh, in in my football life either before or after Gary. So what he achieved was phenomenal. Mark Falco, if Mark Falco could have had the pace of Goth Crooks. I think he would have been one of the number one strikers in the world. He was a very, very, very good player. One of the oddest players I've ever come across. Um, odd as nails. He had a wonder of a left foot. He just lacked the yard of pace. I really believe that if he was very, very quick, he would have been a superb player. Uh, but achieved an incredible a lot, um, even without that extra yard of pace. Um, but that yard, and I've said it to him, so I'm not talking out of turn. I've said it to him. Yeah. If you had had the yard of pace, you would have been an unbelievable footballer. Wow, wow, wow. Interesting, interesting there. Uh, William Kelly, he's a ret- uh, follow up. He says, Messi, I was thinking more along the lines of Maradona. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, actually, to be honest with you, it was both of them copied me. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love it. Whichever <laughs> one's gonna thank you first. Whichever yeah. one's gonna thank you first. Uh, Mickey with the jokes. I'm absolutely loving it. Well, Mickey, we have, we'll take a couple more and, and then we'll let you get on with the rest of your evening, my man. JC okay. says, Mick, could you shed some light on Garrett Brooks? Uh, or uh, what or Gary Brooks, why it took uh, for him so long to uh, recover his uh, from a near death car accident? I'm not sure he ever did recover, to be honest. Um, obviously, he damaged his lung. It made his. Um, he was never the the best runner in the world. Anyway, he was one of the quickest, but he he never had a, lot, a great deal of stamina. So when he punctured his lung in that car crash, um, it made life so much tougher for him. Uh, and I don't think he ever rediscovered himself. Um, and and unfortunately for for Gary, he's had to live with. Um, this feeling that I'll never know what I could have been if I hadn't had this car crash um, mm. because his career was on the up and up um, when it came about and um, I can't I can't imagine how it would feel to have it cruelly snatched away from you even though it didn't feel like it was snatched because you still came back and still played again etc but you were never ever the same player so He's had to live with that all his life. And unfortunately, in his latter life, he's, he's run into quite a few problems. Uh, he was a bit of a gambler. And I, and I often wonder, did the, did the what happened to him sort of push him towards gambling? Um, and he's encountered quite a lot of problems as a consequence of that. But it must be very tough because um, gambling is a mental illness. Um, yeah. Um, uh, but unfortunately, it's frowned upon and it's not really regarded as an illness, but it is. Uh, and Gary needs, enough, Gary needs treatment and I know he's having treatment now um, but he, he should have had it many years ago there should have been a better understanding of the, the mental um, problems that he's been through uh, in his life because of losing virtually losing his career really um, at his boyhood club as well so I have lots of sympathy for Gary uh, and he's a, a, I love them to bits so I, I, I hope one day we get him back uh, uh, free from gambling uh, uh, and back amongst us boys because he lives um, and gets treatment every day now for his gambling addiction. Yeah, I hope hopefully hopefully he can recover. That's for sure. And the truth sets you free. He says two of my former golf students were ranked in the top 150 in the world between 2011 to 2017. What separated them from those who couldn't make it? Was their obsession on work work ethic each day? Was it the same in football? And he also says, "Thanks, Mickey, for stories and insight. You're a real legend." It's a great question. What separates? Well, let me just say this to you: If you were to take the 1,000 best golfers in the world, why is there a number one in the world? and a number 1,000 in the world because they can all hit the ball 300 yards down the middle of the fairway. They can all hit great shots into the green and they can all put. So what separates number one from a 1,000? Mm. has to be the mind, the mentality, the belief, 
the confidence, the approach. Um, and as with every walk of life, uh, I believe, is the more confident you are, the more belief you have, the more likely you will fulfill your talents. Um, it doesn't necessarily always work out to be the case because there's other flaws that you can have also. But if I look at Tiger Woods, for instance, I think he epitomizes um, what I'm saying, the belief, the confidence, the arrogance that he's the best. Um, but then you look at the other flaws that he had, which ultimately led to his demise and, uh, and where he's at now. Um, so for me, the mental strength, the mental character, the mental... Um, ability to be able to focus on the fact that you're the best and believe it is what separates number one for a th from a thousand well wow, yeah, yeah. great answer great yeah. answer you see, honestly he'd be absolutely buzzing off that because he's a real golf golf man so he'd be absolutely buzzing off that spurs 72 says thank you mickey hazard for a great evening watching spurs and um, when you played um when, when you were playing when he was a child, so he's absolutely he made his childhood. Yeah. Saying thank you for the for the thank for you, the... thank you. And Brad Take Matthews out. says, hearing you talk about the eighties gives me um, so much hope. We'll get there again. Great stuff. Cheers. It's quite Brad. sad. It's quite sad that the eighties are still regarded as our glory years. Yeah, well, that's yeah. very sad. Yeah, um, and it's very sad because I watch Spurs year in year out, and all I want is the glory years back. And we've threatened to bring them back, particularly during the Pochettino era. Era, um, but as I've said, the difference between number one and a thousand uh, is in golf is the difference between getting over the line and winning a trophy and not. Um, you know, when you watch your best teams play in a cup final. It's like they they think that they deserve to be there. Mm. It's it's only right that they should be there, and it's only right that they win it. That's the attitude they go out on the pitch with. Whereas the people who are not sort of so self assured, they go out and sort of almost apologise for being there. Uh, when the only way of going and getting over the line is to go there with the mental the mentality that you're a winner, mentality that you're going to win, and mentality that you're the best. Yeah, absolutely yeah. spot on. And I, I think the, mo the key thing people can actually take away from this show today is the winning mentality, believing you're the best. Absolutely. And Mickey, you've reiterated that throughout the whole yeah, podcast. Yeah. You're absolutely yeah. brilliant. But look, maybe one, because we are called the Irish Hotspur, so maybe just a quick one for the Irish fans out there. Um, Derek Hutchinson says, Mickey, what's your thoughts on Tony Galvin? And then also, you know, just for me, have you any Ray Keane stories? <laughs> Tony Galvin, what a player, what a player. Um, adopted Irishman. Um, he was a super player, he was a key cog in he didn't get the recognition that the Glen Ruddles and the Aussie Ardealers and uh, and people like that got. Um, but he was a player's player. He was appreciated and the job he did by every single player on the pitch. And they knew that without him in the team, uh, we lost a big part of the team. His work rate, his, his desire, his attitude, his, his willingness to just keep going and going and going was second to none. He was a very, very, very good player, Tony, and, and, and a key cog in what was a great team. So, yeah. Mm. Do I have any Roy Key sto Keane stories? Not really. Any honest um, opinions maybe on the guy? <laughs> I'll have an honest opinion. I think he's incredible. Um, yeah. I think that... Um, with Roy, you have to accept that this guy's a winner, you know, and he epitomizes what a winner is, yeah. and he doesn't suffer fools gladly. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't live up to his expectations of what a winner is, then that's not enough right for him. Because yeah. he feels that, well, hang on, I don't ask you to do anything that I can't do or won't do. Yeah. I don't demand of you that I don't demand of myself. I don't expect you to put in the effort uh, and, and time that I put in. Um, I demand that you do because that's why I'm the best. That's why I've won so many things. That's why I'm captain. So I'm not 
He doesn't demand of people. When you listen to him do Pundrit, he does it in the same way. He's demanding, he's honest, he's, he's up front. He tells you as it is. I think he's wonderful, I've got to be honest. No, absolutely That doesn't not. mean I enjoyed it when he kicked me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. Right, Keane, he's he's known for kicking everybody. I love I love the guy too. Uh, but look, Mickey, I want to say uh, on behalf of um, all the followers out there um, and, and all your fans out there that are watching us right now, I want to say a massive, massive thank you for giving up thank your time you. this evening. I mean, it's so, so generous. You really didn't have to do it for us. So I want to say a massive thank you. But is there anything you want to say to maybe all your fans out there that, that, that have been watching in tonight? Can I just say, it's been an absolute pleasure, as it is to sit on any show with Spurs fans. Um, the Irish, um, I think they're one of the greatest racers in the world. Um, I, I think if you want to ever be made welcome in a country, go and visit Ireland. They are such incredibly wonderful people, warm, friendly, kind. All the things that I demand of myself, I find the Irish. Sitting on this show tonight, listening to the questions and the compliments, uh, the excitement, um, listening to you guys talk. It's been an absolute pleasure to be on here. Thank you for the support over all the years. Um, not just me, but every player appreciates it. Um, and nothing more to say except come on you Spurs. Come on you Spurs. Wow. And look, I just want to say to you as well quickly, thank you so much for everything you've done for our great club. It really yeah. means the world to me and everyone out there with all them amazing memories. So massive, massive thank you. Um, but look guys, we are going to end it off there. I know exactly what prank I'm going to play on my missus now after the shower. So I'm absolutely looking forward to it. You know, hopefully I get, hopefully I get a good response. Hopefully she falls for it. Uh, but honestly, just one last thing, guys. Yeah. Try not to get in the bath with John Pratt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no Turkish bathhouse. <laughs> See you absolutely all soon. But look, Bye everybody out there. Bye. See yeah. you, Mickey. Thank you See so you much. Thanks man. for a lovely evening, guys. Love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Legend. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you brother. Absolute brilliant. Spurs right. legend, Tottenham legend, FA Cup winner, UEFA Cup winner, Sir Mickey Hazard. Thank you so much, my man. Thank you, guys. See you soon. See you Thank soon. you, Mickey. Thank right. you, what Mickey. an absolute legend. Everybody else out there, thank you so, so much for, uh, you know, um, for tuning in today. I hope you all really, really enjoyed it. I mean, we tried to get as many questions as we could to him. As you can see, Mickey Hazard, he gave us a hell of a lot of time. Absolute great banter as well. He enjoyed it. We enjoyed it. And I hope all you, uh, everyone else out there enjoyed it. Uh, but before we do end off, maybe Jack, Philip, any sort of quick thoughts you want to? Uh, I mean, Philip, I think you should go first, especially for you. What a legend. I mean, that yeah. guy, you know, uh, I'd love to say, I know it, it, he sounds like he could nearly step, put his boots on and play in the Spurs team at the minute. Yes. He's got the positivity, the attitude that our players need at the moment. And I think he's an absolute legend. I think, you know, he's one of the, remember, one of the great Spurs teams of all time. So good of him to give up his time to come on tonight. Yeah. It just shows you how much these guys care for the fans. And I'm absolutely buzzing with that interview. It was brilliant. And well done, lads, for organising it. No, nah, no, nah, look, it's, it's not to do with us. I mean, we just asked him. Mickey gave up the time. So what an absolute legend. Uh, but Jack, any final thoughts? No, I mean, there was just so many snippets that you could have taken out of that. The mentality is just still there. Like, you can still see that winning mentality. Some of the anecdotes that he had about his years past just kind of made you think that maybe we aren't crazy about, you know, sometimes the players should be having that sort of winner's mentality, should be having that sort of, you know, just absolute, just, I don't know, just he had so many snippets of, you know, wisdom about life, wisdom about sport just wisdom about everything and as well like it just i don't know it was he was extremely humble at the same time as well extremely humble about his times past being also reflecting on glenn hoddle getting a bit of that as well ozzy ardila sounds like you know is not only his hero but also his best friend as it's all i don't know dave i'm still a bit shell-shocked a bit starstruck uh thank you very much mickey uh really was it was spectacular seriously the guy had so many words of wisdom and so many beautiful beautiful anecdotes I'll never nah, look at a picture of John Pratt again after that. 
Uh, uh, absolutely quality story. I mean, that's my sort of banter. I was absolutely, oh, I was loving it. I mean, what a man, what a legend. Uh, just a couple of super chats to get through here, and then we will end off, guys. Truth Set Your Free says, Cheers, Mickey. This is to support the channel, lads. Really appreciate Truth Set Your Free. And he also says, What a class interview. Big up, Jack, Phil, and David. Big yourself up, my man. I really appreciate it. And Truth Set Your Free, I'll be buying a, a hazard. Uh, retro jersey, no, hundred percent, my man, hundred percent, and I absolutely, absolutely was loving, you know, that the whole. It's all about winning mentality. You have to believe you're the best. Absolutely brilliant. William Kelly says, "Do you think the legends of our club have been immortalised properly by the club?" I think it might just be a small bit late for Mickey. I don't know if that was for Mickey William, but no, definitely not. I mean, definitely, definitely not. I mean. You're talking about guys that went and won a European trophy. You're talking about guys that have lifted yeah. FA Cups. I mean, you know what I mean? That have brought nothing but success to this club and there's no trophies along the high street. I would like to see it, though, William. I definitely would because we should have something there to immortalise uh, the, the the legends. That's for sure. That's for sure. But big yourself up, William Kelly. Really do appreciate it. Um, and the truth sets you free. says, from Manscape adverts to hazard interviews. Wow. Do you know what? I'll be honest with you. I, I'm, I still can't believe it. I genuinely, I'm still pinching yeah. myself. I'll be honest, for the first couple of minutes, I was like a, a, a big fangirl. I was bumbling over my I words. I couldn't see straight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was fumbling over words and everything. And I was finding it hard to take it all in. But as we got on, I, I mean, absolutely amazing. I, I'm still pinching myself to this day. I mean, at the start of lockdown, you know, I was just a fan with no voice. We are Tottenham TV gave me the platform for a voice. I wanted more, set up this channel and where it's after going from when I first started. I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's beyond dreams. It is beyond dreams. And I know some bigger YouTubers, other people out there might, might look at me saying this and be like, what's he talking about? I mean, but honestly, I, I mean, I did this, I couldn't, I, this, this is my wildest dreams. It's absolutely insane. But look, we are going to end off there, guys. I want to say a massive, massive thank you to everybody. Um, that that tuned in. A massive thank you to everyone who smashed that like button. And if you haven't, make sure you do. A massive thank you to everyone who has smashed that subscribe button. If you haven't, make sure you do as well. And a massive thank you to everybody for the super chats. Really appreciate the support on the channel. Honestly, I've absolutely loved it. And we'll see you again soon. As always, in Conte we trust. Come on, you Spurs. Come and Mickey Hazard is a legend. Mickey Hazard's a legend. Come on, you Spurs. What? No, wrong one. <laughs> Can't tell me. Just quickly before we do end off, Steve D, just in, just in time, Stevie boy, just in time. He says, I can count on one hand how many times I super chat, but the 80s were my teenage years and they were golden years. Thanks, lads. And look, you know what? This is for all you guys out there as well. I actually forgot to say this. How dare me? This is for all you guys out there. I mean, the absolute unbelievable support you have given us, you know what I mean, is, is unbelievable. And without the support you have given us, you, you wouldn't get the likes of you. You wouldn't be able to talk to the likes of Mickey Hazard and stuff like that. So it's all on you guys. So look, you can thank us. But every single day we wake up, I'm thanking you guys, Steve D. So I hope you did really enjoy it. And I, I hope you enjoyed, um, you know, a trip down memory lane. But we will be ending off this time now. Of course, as always, come on, you Spurs. In Conte, we trust, baby. Conte, we trust. Mickey the legend. Everywhere we go. Everywhere we go.